City, I'm Brad Smith alongside Rochelle Akufo. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show of the Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking some early session volume, bringing you today's top market themes, plus elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. Indeed, we've got a packed show for you on this Thursday morning. Futures higher after a fresh reading of the consumer. Retail spending slipping more than Wall Street expected in January, raising questions of whether America's resilient consumer could be losing steam. And investors are digesting the latest round of corporate earnings. Today, we got Cisco, Shake Shack, Wendy's, Yeti, and Crocs to break down for you. And those quarterly results, what they could mean for the market's momentum. Let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance is Jared Blickery, Brian Sazi, and Brooke De Palma have more. That's right, a slowdown in spending. Retail sales falling eight tenths of a percent in January from the month prior, according to Census Bureau data. Economists had priced in a decline of two tenths of a percent. The January report is closely watched by investors looking for signs of a soft landing in the U.S. economy, where inflation cools to the Fed's two percent target rate without an extreme downturn in economic activity. All right, Cisco shares are in the penalty box today. The company saying everything an investor doesn't want to hear on earnings day. Inventory corrections, lower demand, uncertain outlook, worse than expected guidance and layoffs. Maybe I left off something, but I'll figure it out later. Those job cuts will result in around $800 million in severance and termination costs. And fast food and focus this morning following earnings results from burger chains Shake Shack and Wendy's. Shake Shack shares jumping this morning on its earnings beat. Comparable sales also topping the street's estimates. Meanwhile, shares of Wendy's slumping in pre-market trading. The stock moving toward a three-month low after reporting a miss on revenue and profit for the quarter. And here in the U.S., Wendy's customers visited less but spent more where they went. Well, good morning, everyone. U.S. retail sales declined more than expected for the month of January. Retail sales falling eight-tenths of a percent compared to the two-tenths of a percent that was forecasted. Sales excluding auto and gas also sliding compared to estimates for an increase here. There you're taking a look at some of the figures, the actuals where they came in at, and there's a few elements of this to break down. Of course, this another reading though, more broadly on the consumer, and that resiliency picture that we've been talking about here continues to be in focus as we're trying to understand exactly how the Fed will read through, of course, giving more weight to CPI, giving more weight to PCE, retail sales not necessarily the top of mind for the Fed to really evaluate, but still another data point for them to get some understanding about what that resiliency means. May look like here. It's true. I mean, even though one month does not a trend make, we know that we've been waiting for the, we've been seeing these signs of the consumer pulling back, whether right. it's perhaps downgrading a little bit, perhaps, you know, not buying as big of a meal, or perhaps, you know, making some trade-offs in terms of supporting a brand versus uh, some of the uh, the store-owned brands as well. So it, it does feed into that. And we also have to bake in some seasonality, obviously coming off the back of a, a big shopping season as well. In January, people taking advantage of some of the sales. But we continue to see again, as we saw yesterday, Low volumes, but seeing infl with inflation still up, those higher prices, but perhaps the beginning of some of the concern that we were seeing about the consumer pulling back even more. Yeah, absolutely. Total sales uh, that we were continuing to look at here, $700.3 billion, just to put that round figure on it or the larger figure on it. And then additional retail trade sales down 1.1% from December 2023 and down two-tenths of a percent below last year here. So ultimately, you know, even as we think about where consumers are still kind of trying to prioritize their purchases in some of those goods versus services, this extremely good goods focused here, but still a larger question of what and where the pushback will continue to persist in terms of some of the consumers looking at where pricing is just too high or just where they don't need an additional appliance. If I already got, you know, one dishwasher, I probably don't need two, especially not in these small New York apartments anyway. Indeed. And important to note that when it comes to the core, excluding auto and gas, that did fall, that did fare a little bit better. Um, that was at uh, five tenths of a percent slipping there versus the 0.2 percent expected. Well, Cisco shares taking a hit in the pre-market after slashing its full-year guidance and announcing layoffs that will impact 5% of its workforce, amounting to about 4,000 employees. Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sozzi, is here to break this down for us. Give us some context here, Brian. Yeah, well, unfortunately, uh, I don't have much uh, in the way of positive things to say about this quarter from Cisco, so let me just check through some of them. Uh, really, everything you don't want to hear from a big cap tech company Cisco served up last night on its earnings day uh, talked about slowing demand or worse than expected demand. 
an ongoing inventory correction, which may not improve into the second half of this year. Uh, talk of uh, large telecoms perhaps not really aggressively investing in their business until 2025. And then last but not least, Cisco came in here and said they will sack 4,200 employees to improve their profit margins because demand is in fact slowing. But don't take my word for it. Here's what Chuck Robbins, chair and CEO of Cisco, had to say about the quarter. First, in terms of the macro environment, we are seeing a greater degree of caution and scrutiny of deals given the high level of uncertainty. As we're hearing this from our customers, it's leading us to be more cautious with our forecast and expectations. Second, as we discussed last quarter and subsequently saw in other technology provider results, customers have been taking time since the start of our fiscal 2024 to deploy the elevated levels of products shipped to them in recent quarters, and this is taking longer than our initial expectations. Third, we also continue to see weak demand with our telco and cable service provider customers. All right, so the vibe on the street, guys, is that for the second consecutive quarter, uh, Cisco really, I think, surprised a lot of folks on the street, resetting guidance, telling folks we cannot deliver up to the expectations we set previously. And there's some of those vibes on the street. I think the Jeffries team, uh, I think it was Chris Nodder, really letting uh, Cisco have it, noting uh, on his second trip through the inventory correction Confessionals, a very aggressive headline from the team over at Jefferies, uh, and uh, just critical analysis by their team. And then lastly here, look at this uh, Yahoo Finance che investor checklist. If you're waking up this morning, you see the top trending ticker on the Yahoo Finance platform, you see Cisco, you're trying to make sense of it, here's your guide essentially in four bullet points. Not a good quarter like I mentioned, not a good quarter like I mentioned. Cleaner quarters will likely take time to emerge. That is me just using my analysis or my experience covering retail and applying it to technology. When you have over levels or just too much inventory in any forms of channels, usually it takes two to four quarters to work out and margins to improve. And last but not least, remember, Cisco still has a $28 billion deal on the line in Splunk. If there's any positive thing here to say, they did note on the earnings call that deal might close a little earlier than expected by the end of the second quarter, might lead to that executive team coming out with uh, higher guidance later this year to incorporate that Splunk division. But again, not a good quarter. And I have more context uh, on this one on the uh, Yahoo Finance Live Markets blog, not our homepage. I had a lot to say about Cisco and I had to get it out somewhere. Well, you got it out here this morning and of course they're on the blog as well. I mean, there was a lot to really chew on from that earnings call as well. You know, just was, we wrapped this up. Them saying it's going to be possibly one to two quarters away from full implementation of some of that inventory that you were talking about as well here. So uh, You can't just get rid of inventory magically. No. It takes a few quarters, even if it's on sale. Brian Sousey, thanks so much for joining us on set. Breaking down all things Cisco, we'll continue to track that trending ticker here this morning. We're also tracking fast food. If you're hungry out there, fast food in focus after earnings reports from burger chains like Shake Shack and Wendy's. Shares of Shake Shack skyrocketing on its Q4 report, seeing a beat on both the top and bottom line. Comparable sales also surpassing the street's estimates. Shares of Wendy's, on the other hand, fallen, as Alicia Keys would say, after a sales miss and a weak outlook for the full year. Here with some takeaways, we've got Yahoo Finance's Brooke DePalma. Hey, Brooke. Good morning to you both. I mean, certainly this is the tale of two burger chains going, one going really well and the other one not going as well. And Shake Shack, let's kick things off there. Analysts expecting to really applaud this. The street really already uh, very well pleased with these quarterly results. The company was more profitable in Q4 despite inflationary headwinds that we've seen in food and packaging costs. In addition to that, the CEO lending that profitability due to strategic marketing initiatives like their partnership with Trolls, as well as a fun promotion with the chicken dance that they did with the NFL where they gave out free chicken jacks. They also implemented kiosks at all their domestic company operated stores and those continue to bode well for the company is like we're seeing with many other fast food and fast casual chains. People tend to spend more on these digital kiosks. Now the company does expect total revenue for 2024 to come in between 1.21 billion to 1.25 billion. That's growing around 11 percent to 15 percent year over year. But menu prices will return to a more pre-COVID normalized level of roughly two and a half percent. So that's good news, although higher good news. But watch out because in California, with that fast act coming to play in April, they do expect to raise prices even higher there to offset that labor inflation. But Randy Grudy is coming out of the CEO role. They did say on the call that we can expect a transition of leadership in the coming months. But like I said, Wall Street really applauding this. Uh, uh, William Blair analyst saying longer term, we continue to view Shake Shack's growth runway as one of the strongest and proven among emerging restaurant brands. They did nearly double their footprint since 2019. 
but largely we'll wait and see how this all goes as there's so much going on uh, globally in terms of conflicts. Wendy's on the other hand, not so good. Indeed, seeing a lot of new ones in fast food and fast casual coming out this earnings season. Appreciate you keeping us up to speed. Our very own Brooke De Palma. All right, well, futures edging higher today. This comes after Chicago Federal Reserve President Austin Goolsbee calming nerves about inflation coming in hotter than expected. Take a listen. You want to measure in three months, six months, 12 month increments. If you do that, it's totally clear that inflation is coming down. We've had six, seven months in a row of the new flow rate of inflation has been very close to target or, or uh, approaching the target. Well, to break down what this means for investors, Mohamed El Arian, Alliance Chief Economic Advisor and Yahoo Finance's 3 to 5 anchor, Julie Hyman, both joining us here for this chat. Good to have you on the show here. I know a lot of people trying to make sense of what they saw with the CPI data. And then you have Austin Goolsby coming out. But then you have Raphael Bostic also saying, look, we're perhaps expecting rate cuts looking at the summertime. What should investors make of some of the Fed speak and CPI data that we've had so far? I think investors should make three things. One is that the last mile, getting the 2% is not going to be smooth. Second, that the marketplace had over embraced the notion of a very soft landing that would allow the Fed to cut a lot. I think it's right now to listen to the Fed when they say three cuts, probably starting in September. At one point, the marketplace had priced in seven. So the marketplace has adjusted. And then the third element is to ask itself, why do we get such outsized reactions to data? The data miss wasn't that huge, but the market reaction was enormous. We saw yields move by 13 to 18 basis points in a single session. And that tells you a little bit about market functioning and depth. So take it away as, yes, it was a data miss, but I think it's aligning expectations more with what's likely to happen. Uh, Mohammed, it's Julie. It's great to see you. Um, I also wonder how we should think about the retail sales data that we got this morning, which showed that much larger than expected decline um, in retail sales. And it, again, just the sort of murky picture that we have here, where largely the data has been beating expectations, showing the resilience of the U.S. economy. And then you get a, a figure like that. Is that just sort of a blip? I hope it's a blip, Julia. It's wonderful to see you. I hope it's a blip. Um, if it's not, I would worry more about that number than the inflation number. Why? Because U.S. exceptionalism has been based on the ability to continue to grow and grow powered by the household sector and powered by retail sales. That is why we have outperformed other economies. That is why our stock market has done so well. It's the ability to grow. So I think that, that this number is a flashing yellow number. It's just one data point, so I don't want to make too much out of it. But when I look at the two data misses, if you like, higher than expected inflation and lower than expected retail sales, I worry more about the retail sales one than I do about the inflation one. Mohammed, I wonder where else you might be seeing those yellow signals, if you will. And I know you're a macro guy, but we're, you know, coming up onto the end of earnings season. We just heard about Cisco a few moments ago and some of the issues it's having. We've heard from some of the travel companies about some of that travel waning. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot of companies talking about signs of, of spotty sort of weakening demand. Does all of that add up to a yellow signal as well? It does. In fact, today's number is catching up with a lot of what we've heard from companies for the last few weeks. You've summarized it well. Um, and it has tended to be companies that serve lower income households that are seeing softness happen. So I think of this retail sales number as, as basically capturing what we've heard. Um, the key issue is the guidance, as you know. And here we're a little bit all over the place. Some companies are saying they continue to expect weakness. Others are seeing um, things picking up. And that just speaks to the amount of dispersion we are likely to get. Individual name selection is going to be critical, Julie, going forward. 
Mohammed, in the clip that we were playing a moment ago from uh, Goolsby, he went on to say just after that how much they're monitoring the housing part of this inflationary picture, which continues to, to come in amazingly sticky and even more outsized than they anticipated. All that considered, what are the catalysts that you would be watching for that you anticipate may bring the housing component more in support of the Fed target? So the problem with housing, as, as you know, is the supply side is that there isn't enough supply and therefore prices have stayed up even though affordability has declined. Um, part of it is people don't want to give up low um, rate mortgages and I wouldn't. Why give it up unless you have a really good reason? So, so we're not seeing the flow that we normally see. So you, you, people are being frustrated on quantity and price is not adjusting. Um, a couple of comments on the Fed. One is be careful of a Fed that's too data dependent. The emphasis on the Fed is always on backward looking data. And what's really important is, the, is for the Fed to mix that with some view of where we're going. Otherwise, you're conducting monetary policy looking through the rear view mirror. Monetary policy acts with a lag. Two, the main issue about in inflation is gonna be services, core services. They remain hot. They need to disinflate faster before outright good deflation, prices of goods actually coming down, turns around and starts going up again. So as much as I would focus on housing, I would also focus on core services because that's where we need to see faster disinflation. Um, Mohammed, put it all together for the people who are watching who are wondering what the heck they should be doing in the markets right now, right? Um, should they be putting more money to work in equities right now, for example, even as we are at these at or near these new highs? I think you need to look at what you're holding and make sure that you're comfortable buying it today. That's, that's the first thing you need to do. Um, we're going to see a lot more dispersion going forward. So it's really important to have that discipline. Second, don't fall into the trap of fading the U.S. too early. Um, there's a lot of pressure because the U.S. has outperformed by so much um, to look at other parts of the world, Europe in particular. Um, if you look at other parts of the world, they're doing much worse than the U.S. Today, we got news that the U.K. is in a technical recession, two consecutive quarters of negative growth. And we got the news that Japan is in a technical recession. Europe is also going to be in a recession. So when you look in terms of relatives, the U.S. still dominates in terms of economic growth, in terms of inflation performance, and in terms of its ability to attract money for future drivers of growth. So I, I would be careful not to fall into the trap that some people have fallen into consistently over the last few years of fading the U.S. too early. And Mohammed, I mean, we're going to be getting a, an influx of data, jobless claims, import export prices, industrial production. But in terms of forward looking indicators, what is your what is you what are you looking at in terms of what's giving you the best indication of where the economy is headed? Earnings call. I listen really carefully to earnings call. Um, you can start putting a an image together by listening to different earnings calls and what they're telling you about what they are seeing. Companies are at the forefront and they have a much better sense of what's going on on the ground at turning points. And this is, this could be a turning point. So listen carefully to what companies are telling us. You know, this is the reason why a lot of people missed the inflation call, calling it transitory. They weren't listening to the companies. The companies were making it very clear back in 2021 that their costs were going up and they felt confident they could pass it on. And companies were telling us that they have pricing power and they're going to raise prices, but people somehow dismissed it from a macro perspective as transitory. S listen to companies. They also indicated to us why we didn't fall into recession. 14 months ago, most people were thinking the US were going to fall into recession. The companies were saying our businesses are strong. So in order of forward looking, nothing beats what companies tell you. Does that mean that companies, as well as investors, have been over-exuberant on the other side for cuts here? Oh, I mean, I remember, and I was talking to Julie about it at the end of last year, the market was pricing in six to seven cuts starting in March. And I remember thinking, 
you know, what what are the markets seeing that is not there? Yes, we got over exuberance. November, December was a period of incredible exuberance. Um, we made money as in, as investors on both our stocks and our bonds. We we fully embraced a soft landing, um, and we went too far. Now the fixed income market has adjusted. You know, fixed income has delivered negative returns this year so far. Um, so you've had the adjustment on the fixed income side, and fortunately, because the economy has been so strong, it has not come at the cost of equities. So equities are having a decent year, even though rates have moved up. And that just shows you the strength of the U.S. economy. Thank you so much for joining us. Teeing up today's trading activity, Mohamed El Arian and Julie Hyman joining us for the conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Shares of Deer are moving to the downside by about 4%. The company beat the street's expectations on the top and bottom line. Deer, though, trimmed its profit outlook on falling crop prices. Industry sentiment has been relatively weak in recent months, but our next guest remains bullish on Deer, calling the world's largest farm machinery producer a bellwether and best-in-class operator. For a deeper dive into the company's results, we're joined by Kristen Owen, Oppenheimer Senior Analyst and Executive Director. Kristen, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. Here, Why? Why a best-in-class operator here and that title that you're giving John Deere? Yeah, thanks, Brad, for having me. Um, you know, John Deere, as the market leader, it would be easy to say, well, they, as the leader, they should be, you know, best in class. But what we really like about this stock and what we think is differentiated over a long time horizon is that Deere was very early to see the opportunity set in technology and how technology can be used to make farmers more productive. So that journey started over 20 years ago, really laid a foundation for Deere to have a a head start ahead of the competition. We are now seeing that competition sort of get to where Deer was 10, 15 years ago. Deer now incorporating tools like AI, onboard intelligence. We think that that's going to continue to spin the flywheel for them and really sets them ahead of their competitors. Now you've got some near-term dynamics related to the cycle that I'm sure we're gonna talk about this morning, but that's why we continue to believe that they are best in class, best executors and best positioned from a technology perspective. And Kristen, we did see some, some pressure on the stock price today, mostly based on the fiscal outlook for 2024, especially looking at large agriculture 
agriculture in the US and Canada, expecting that to be down 10 to 15 percent. How worrying is that in terms of, especially is, as this is meant to be a bellwether here? Sure. Rochelle, it, we have been in this unprecedented uh, level of optimism over the last two to three years, just given commodities prices, we've had a lot of volatility in commodities backdrop related to geopolitical events, related to COVID. Um, so I would say we were in sort of an unprecedented uh, setup coming into this year. We're now seeing some moderation. We heard last week um, from the USDA, net farm income is expected to come down about 27% in 2024. That's an inflation adjusted number, but it is coming back to a level that is about on par with the 20 year average. So that we are now seeing in North America, the expectation that equipment sales are also likely to be down in that, you know, 10 to 15 deer, probably closer to 20, just given its relative market size and what we heard this morning. Um, sort of consistent with where we are seeing net farm income and those farm balance sheets. So it's not that we're expecting something to fall off the cliff. It's rather this is a return to some more normalized activity levels. How much of the play for John Deere is is artificial intelligence? I mean, this is an interesting new thread within how the business is going to be operating some of the machinery, be pushing inventory onto new prospective clients as well. Without question, I think that there is some benefit that is baked into the multiple for John Deere relative to some of its peers, just given its um, presentation of that technology story, where we think it starts to flow through on the fundamentals. And, and as we all know, the sentiment will move ahead of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, is what it can do from a business model perspective. If Deere is able to charge for the incremental productivity that that onboard intelligence is providing, and, and it's really simple stuff. I mean, we're talking about sensing what's happening on the field and acting in real time rather than a, a farmer having to get out of the cab and adjust his settings. Um, he can do that through, through the computer. Um, that's real productivity savings, and we believe that Deere can benefit from those those productivity savings through recurring revenue model that reduces the city of the earnings of a company. This, you know, we don't think that this is going to be particularly relevant current down cycle, but in years from now, you know, deer are getting to have more than 10 of its revenue. Kristen, recurring. We're, having, we're having a little bit of uh, trouble hearing you, so we'll have to leave it there, but we do appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Kristen Owen Oppenheimer, Senior Analyst and Executive Director, thank you for your time this morning. All right, stay with us here on Yahoo Finance. We'll be back on the other side of this break.
Well, we did it again. That is the opening bell on Wall Street. You're taking a look at the NYSC where Palmer Square is ringing the opening bell up on the podium. PSBD is the ticker symbol there. And then Tepo Gen Bio with the fun Fetty in Midtown Manhattan at the NASDAQ. All right, great, great bunch of folks up there. All right, let's take a look at how things open up here on the day. It looks like we're going to open up higher across the board that NASDAQ is calibrating. But taking a look at the Dow and the S&P 500 green on the screen, let's go straight to Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickery at the Interactive. Jared, what are you seeing? Hey, Brad, we're looking at another bump up. Uh, we had some decent gains yesterday, but that was coming off of a nasty, nasty loss, uh, the worst in terms of small caps for a couple of years. And here's the small caps up another, <clears throat> excuse me, 1% today. Here's over the last three days. So you can see, you can still see they're down about 1% over this time frame. have not quite climbed, clawed back all of those losses. But I want to check on the bond market as well. We are seeing the 10-year Tino yield down a bit, down six basis points. So let me just show you a line chart so you can see this is the, uh, the price action this year. And we are off of our highs a little bit. But the trend has been up. I've been talking about that quite a bit. Uh, I also want to check in on the semiconductors. Um, if I have time, I'm going to go through some heat maps here. But over the last year, uh, to another record high, only yesterday, I believe, up 46 percent. Um, one of the sectors I've also been tracking are the transports. And it's interesting because in Dow theory, you want to see the transports confirm what's happening with the industrials. But here, I'm looking at the Dow transports in purple compared to IYT, which is the iShares transport CTF. You can see this one here, which has a high waiting to Uber. Uber is its number one component. That has been hitting record highs. That is off the charts here. That is at a record high. While the regular transports, they are just uh, lingering below those highs. So it makes you wonder if Uber should be part of the Dow transports. But that's a conversation for another day. Want to check out the sector action. Real estate is flying high, maybe because of that reprieve we're seeing in the bond market. That's up over 1%. In a distant second is materials, followed by utilities and staples. So for the most part, the winners today are in the defensive sectors. Now, taking a look at the NASDAQ 100, we're seeing more red than green in the mega caps. We do have Alphabet down about 2%, Alpha, Apple down half a percent, but Meta is up 1% just about, and Tesla up about 1.5%. I did want to check on the semiconductors. This is our heat map. This is just what's happening today. ARM up another 5%. Let me show you the year-to-date totals here. Uh, just a little bit, uh, halfway into February, and we're seeing some incredible, incredible moves. There's uh, SMCI that's up 236%, ARM up 77%. Then a distant third, you get NVIDIA up almost 50%, Taiwan Semi, ASML up in the 20s. So uh, the list goes on, but uh, we have seen a lot of these laggard chip stocks just catch up to NVIDIA and even surpass some of those totals that we've seen. Appreciate you breaking down all that sector action as well for us, our very own Jared Blickery. Well, the resilient consumer might be slowing down. Out today, retail sales declining more than expected in January. To break down what risks may lie ahead for the market, we have Samir Samana, Wells Fargo Investment Institute Senior Global Market Strategist. Thank you for joining us this morning. So how much should we read into this print? You know, we've been saying for some time that the consumer is going to hit a wall, especially after the holidays. I mean, when you look at what's going on with the labor market, which is starting to cool, when you look at the fact that interest rates, although they didn't have an impact right away, anytime somebody goes to refinance a mortgage or buy a new home or take out a new credit card or a new auto loan, they're paying a much, much higher rate than they did a few years ago. And so we think that that's going to continue to slow the economy. And that's probably going to put some downward pressure on the consumer, which thus far has been very resilient. And we've been focused in on, of course, a lot of the different readings on the consumer earlier this week. It was CPI, of course, here today, retail sales. Where for investors is really the better gauge of still this consumer and the resiliency, but also now the question of that resiliency as put on by the retail sales figure? Yeah, I mean, look, the consumer is going to spend as long as they have a job, right? As long as they have a job, as long as they can access income, they're probably going to spend. I mean, that's just how it always works historically, right? They're some of the last folks to kind of figure out that there's a, you know impending slowdown. So I think what you need to do is look at those leading economic indicators. I think what you need to do is acknowledge how much higher interest rates are. I think you need to acknowledge how much, you know, kind of higher the, the costs most of us are, are, you know, spending just to kind of keep our households going. And I think from that standpoint, 
point, I think you can see that once the labor market weakens significantly, which it should as the year goes on, you can see that in some of the layoff announcements and, and some of the other areas that we look at, um, that's going to eventually catch up to the consumer and they're probably going to get hit probably the second half of this year. So, Samir, obviously a, a wave of economic data coming out this week. Would you say there are three particular when it comes to economic growth risks that markets are still underpricing at the moment? Yeah, I mean, look, the first one is inflation, right? I mean, the, the tricky part is you're still seeing companies have quite a bit of pricing power, although it's less than it was. You're still seeing wages be quite a bit sticky. Unfortunately, that has a lot to do with the fact that there's still a shortage of labor. And then, honestly, I think it's just you know the lag this time around because of those interest rates, because everybody refinanced in 2020, 2021. Um, I think that lag is a little bit longer this time. But you know, honestly, history tells you it's about two years from when the Fed first starts hiking rates, when the economy slows, and we're right on right on schedule. And I think later this year, um, I think those rate impacts will will, will really show up. Okay, and so as we're continuing to really evaluate where, where the investors who are evaluating this data are, are trying to position their portfolios, what is the, the hot positioning that they should be considering if the Fed pushes out its, its rate cutting? Yeah, so we, look, we would still play defense at the portfolio level. That means, you know, underweighting equities and favoring fixed income, and we like commodities. They, they tend to do well, especially when inflation surprises to the upside, where we're not quite you know, giving up on, on inflation as, as maybe others are. Um, at the sector level, we like industrials, materials, energy, and healthcare. Those are sectors with great you know, cheap valuations, companies that have just as much profitability as some of the tech and tech plus areas. Um, but again, the valuations are much more reasonable, which will hold up in a higher rate environment. Um, we would avoid consumer discretionary, real estate and financials, you know, mostly for obvious reasons. But again, we think the consumer hits a wall and we think, you know, real estate, especially commercial real estate, continues to be a problem that tends to, to impact REITs. And then for financials, I mean, look, it's just going to be very difficult to make money if you don't have a steep curve. And for those who are wondering if it's too late for them to, to get defensive, especially given the moves that we continue to see in yields in some of these defensive sectors, have they missed the boat there? Or is, is there still room to get in? I mean, look, with the market at all time highs, there's probably never been a better time for you to get more defensive, right? Because probably the, the, the areas that you're trimming, um, especially right now, those tech and tech plus areas, again, they, they have done so well. You know, you just mentioned semiconductors and how well they've done. Not to take anything away from the longer term earnings power, but again, they've really overshot. And those are the areas we want folks to, to probably trim most. All right, Samir Samana, Wells Fargo Investment Institute, Senior Global Market Strategist. Thank you so much for taking the time here this morning. Appreciate it. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Let's take a look at one trending ticker that we're watching this morning. Twilio shares sinking after forecasting revenue for its current quarter below expectations and elected not to give a full year outlook as, it's rev as it reviews its segment business unit. Now, this is the company's first earnings report since longtime CEO Jeff Lawson stepped down due to activist investors. Um, obviously, the, the company in something of a, a transition here, um, seeing that co-founder announcing that he was stepping down last month. And of course, this activist scrutiny that we continue to see in, their, in the operational review of its segment business unit that is set to conclude in March. But it's sort of one less thing to, that you didn't want, one less thing you had to worry about here. Yeah, absolutely. I was pouring through this earnings transcript, and one of the huge things that kind of jumped out is they're just trying to, at this point, mitigate within that segment um, part of the business, mitigate churn and contraction. Not what you want to hear, especially as you're trying to think about where it's going to also, on the other side, continue to investing. So CapEx, at the same time that you're experiencing perhaps moderation and demand that's showing up through some of this churn uh, of customers and, and contraction that they talked about on the call, that means that you've got money going out the door where you're also just seeing perhaps some stalling uh, mm -hmm. in the other element of where that money is coming in. Um, so, or the spend levels as well here. Even though you did see fourth quarter revenue, that was up by about 5% revenue basis there. Uh, and then additionally here, you saw the fourth quarter and full year loss, um, ultimately here, the non-GAAP loss, at least from operations, $173 million and then $533 million uh, respectively there. So still a lot of questions here and you're seeing that play out within the stock here today. It's true and they did try to alleviate some of those concerns. They talked about some of their cost cutting measures, talked about enhancing their focus and execution while optimizing their capital allocation strategy. They talked about things like cost structure, accelerating their path to profitability, profitability and delivering durable growth. The markets though don't seem to be that convinced here, especially given the reaction that we've seen here. And we have to keep in mind this is a a, a customer engagement platform, at least that's how they coin themselves. Yeah. And with a lot of people back in the office, perhaps not needing not needing to use Twilio and finding perhaps other other options as well. Well, and, and within this too, it sounds like within how they're looking at the allocation of resources as well, it's very clear through some of the language that they used as well on the call operational changes that they're going to make re with respect to segment here. And that's, I think, something that analysts are going to be continuing to keep close tabs on exactly what the impact of those operational changes looks like as they're kind of reviewing the overall business and making some more of those AI-powered capability um, investments for the company and, and for the product and service that they're taking to clients right now. And they did uh, bring up customer AI, saying that they had seen some early signs of success with their customer AI and really have an aggressive product roadmap. And that's something that uh, the analysts that we've been talking to are saying, that's what people want to see. They want right. to see the product roadmap. They want to see the use cases here. They want to see actual use cases of how this AI is going to be initiated versus something nice that people tack on on an earnings call. Yeah, common denominator. Does it even AI is that common thread that we're hearing right now. Also here, we got to talk a little Coinbase on the day. Coinbase shares pop. As JP Morgan upgrades the stock to neutral, the move comes as a reflection of the surge in Bitcoin and broader cryptocurrency prices. Bitcoin prices hitting 52,000 as it regains its $1 trillion market cap here. Uh, it should be uh, $2 trillion market cap there for uh, the overall cryptocurrency market here. Um, I'll check back in on that in just a hot second, but that's at least where I saw it this morning. But as we're thinking about what the catalysts are for not just Coinbase, but also for Bitcoin at whole, we continue to talk at length about what the event of the Bitcoin having could mean more, more largely, but also for the crypto market cap as a whole, what the filing of ET, uh, Ethereum ETFs could also mean for so much more attention and investability. We saw how that played out in Robinhood's earnings as well this week, too. So that perhaps one of the other major catalysts to watch. I did think it was interesting that um, Gary Gensler, SEC Gary Gensler, chair, saying really trying to temper expectations right. about ETF uh, uh, spot futures coming into play in the same way that they saw with spot Bitcoin ETFs. Mm -hmm saying really in making it a one case situation when it comes to Bitcoin didn't seem that convinced about spot uh, spot e e um, Ethereum ETFs. Right. It is a very different beast. As we mentioned, it's both the coin, the token and the blockchain that it runs on. So it is a lot more nuanced than focusing on it as a token. And we continue to see against the focus that on it 
as the exception right. and not necessarily the rule. So something to keep in mind when we're sort of comparing um, Bitcoin and the potential for Ethereum as well. And just the context within the Coinbase call as well that JP Morgan made here, just to conclude with that, uh, they said, in their opinion, they think this Bitcoin appreciation is contributing to better spot Bitcoin ETF flows, which is in turn driving Bitcoin prices higher and pulling other tokens higher as well. That related to the crypto landscape here. And uh, again, they also did cite some of the meaningful Bitcoin price appreciation, really pointing back to the U.S. Bitcoin spot ETFs. Uh, it was initially a sell the news event, though, mm. that they did note within this as well and within this call. So um, ultimately, we'll see exactly how the street continues to react to this JP Morgan upgrade to neutral from underweight new price target $80 here for Coinbase. All right, everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Yeti shares sinking after missing expectations on the top and bottom line in the fourth quarter. The cooler and drinkware maker reporting revenue of $519.8 million and adjusted earnings per share of 90 cents. The company also is also issuing a conservative 2024 outlook. Now, this comes as hype has grown around Stanley, a competitor in the travel tumbler market that has seen sales jump almost 300 percent year over year according to our next guest. Joining us now, this is Anna Glasgow, B. Riley Securities Senior Analyst for Consumer Equity Research. Thank you for joining us this morning here. So in terms of what the markets are reacting to here, I mean, this, this outlook, it was a very cautious outlook that we saw here. Do you think the markets are reacting appropriately to this? 
You know, Yeti has been, you know, a really high quality name for a long time. Its historical growth algorithm has been in the 10 to 15 percent. You know, I think Yeti was smart in setting cons expectations conservatively, coming out with 7 to 9 percent growth. But when you have that sort of reset of expectations, it's natural that the markets will see a correction. And so how much of this can we correlate to one of their competitors, Stanley, which has seen viral fanfare, which has perhaps seen a, a wave of new consumers make its way towards their products versus a Yeti product? Sure. Actually, I mean, in the quarter, you know, we wrote about Stanley. Stanley has obviously been a really popular topic, especially given the growth that they've seen over the past few years. But Yeti's drinkware actually came in ahead of expectations. It grew 12% year over year versus expectations or our model for around 10% growth. So what we're seeing isn't necessarily an impact from Stanley directly or a problem in drinkware. The company actually noted that their cooler business, coolers and equipment, saw an impact from a more cautious consumer on high ticket items. So when you think about the price points versus drinkware, you know, in that $30 to $50 range versus coolers, which can be upwards of $300, you're seeing a bit more of a cautious consumer. And so that's really what drove the shortfall versus expectations on the top line. And I don't have to ask you about demographics here, because when you think of where you tend to see, you know, Yeti products show up, things like the coolers, very different from, you know, my fifth grader and her entire grade all wanting Stanley cups. How different are the, the demographics that these two companies are really targeting? Yeah, I mean, when, when the Stanley craze first started coming out, I think it was dismissed as, well, this is really an incremental consumer. You know, Yeti is really passionate, or the Yeti brand really focuses around that passionate outdoorsman, the fisherman, the hunter. Um, and so the typical Stanley customer that we're seeing is very different from that. And so overall, we think they are reaching a cu customer that isn't necessarily in Yeti's core wheelhouse. But when you, like you mentioned, have nearly 300% growth in a product that is within your broader category, clearly there is some impact there. You, I just want to go back to something that you mentioned about the coolers here. How, how much of that do you think is still kind of lingering after effect from the recalls that had taken place in recent years? Well, as they talked about on the call, you know, they started their soft cooler relaunch with a more limited color assortment. Um, and so, and they felt that given that the products were out of the market um, through 2023, that the brand awareness is still growing and recapturing where it was prior to the recall. So I think there was some impact, but overall, I think it seems to be a more cautious consumer that's really hitting that, you know, 300 plus price point. And they did talk about also innovation, not just in the US, but globally as well. And they do expect to see positive reaction to innovation across their entire product portfolio in 2024. What does that look like? What's going to, to get them to the, the price target that you have for them? Sure. Well, my price target is at 42, so relatively in line with where the stock is trading now. Um, I think Yeti historically has been very focused on innovation. They have a very strong innovation track record. And I think one of the more interesting things on innovation is these two acquisitions that they've done in this quarter, Mystery Ranch and Butterpat, which extend them more deeply into um, soft bags and um, as well as cookware. And so I think we're going to see a lot of exciting things with Yeti getting beyond what we've historically expected from them under their um, singular brand umbrella. Is this a company that could, at least in an environment like we have seen today with some of the retail sales numbers that have come out, where a trade down among some of their core customers could impact Yeti more broadly? And, and how would you be monitoring that? Overall, I mean, Yeti, the perennial question has been, why would you spend $400 on a cooler when there's cheaper alternatives at Walmart and other stores? And I think that story won't really ever go away for Yeti, but I think Yeti has proven over its extended track record that there is clearly demand for a premium brand in this category. And I don't think necessarily the purchase consideration is between a cheaper product or a Yeti. When people buy a Yeti cooler, they're really buying for the brand and the quality that it represents. And so I don't necessarily see them suffering from trade down, but potentially if you do have a hard cooler, maybe you're not replenishing that, you're extending the replacement cycle. And what do you think um, Yeti is going to need to do, I guess, from a consumer visibility perspective, to have all that innovation and some of the streamlining that they're doing to really have it hit home for consumers? 
Sure. I mean, I think they do uh, really well in terms of their marketing, keeping it really specific to that outdoorsman using their ambassador programs. Um, I think with, you know, the Stanley craze, for example, it kind of shows that there are cons customer demographics that they haven't historically gone for. And, you know, they have introduced straw tumbler product to go after to widen that aperture that they approach. And so I think through their innovation, through introducing new use occasions, they are going to continue to reach a wider audience. Anna Glackman, who is the B. Riley Senior uh, Security Senior Analyst for Consumer Equity Research. Thank you so much for taking the time here with us today, talking all things the fun part of the equity markets and Yetis and Stanleys and keeping everything cool. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Certainly. We've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. You hear the music, you know what time it is. It's 10 a.m. I'm Brad Smith alongside Rochelle Kufo. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks ticking higher this morning, striving to mount a further rebound as investors digest the latest retail sales number, showing a slowdown in spending falling eight tenths of a percent in January from the month prior, according to the Census Bureau data. Indeed, also taking a look at some individual trending tickers, shares of app loving surging after blowing past expectations in its fourth quarter 
and issuing a strong outlook. The company had a strong holiday season with major growth in its mobile app advertising market and bidding enhancements pushed profits higher. We're also watching Penn Entertainment shares. They are falling as they reported a revenue miss for the fourth quarter, down 12% in the last year. A Jeffries analyst saying the losses are likely due to the casino operator's investment in ESPN bet, which, quote, has negatively impacted overall company performance. That's right. Also watching Ford shares rising this morning as its CEO Jim Farley and CFO John Lawler discuss its Ford Plus growth plan at Wolf Research Conference this morning. Farley saying that the build cost of the F-150 Lightning EV is, quote, too expensive and that the company has to sell EVs just three to $5,000 above gas car prices. Well, we've got some breaking economic data out for you here this morning. Home builder sentiment rises for the third consecutive month. We have our very own Danny Romero here with the details. Hey, Danny. Hi, Brad. Well, home builders are feeling a lot more confident in February. The National Association of Home Builders reported that the index rose four points to 40 eight points in February. This is the highest level since August of 2022. And builders are expecting for more buyer appetite to enter the market as these mortgage rates uh, soften a bit. But what stood out to me from this report is really that builders will be pulling back on incentives. 28, 25% of builders reported cutting home prices. That's down from 31% in January. While Meanwhile, the share of builders offering some form of an incentive dropped to 58% in February. That's down from 62% in January. So that's really different from what the public home builders have been saying on their earnings call. We've heard from DR Horton, Lennar. They've really pointed out that they are not going to be pulling back on incentives, especially that popular incentive, the mortgage rate buy down. That is when you upfront the builder upfronts the cost to lower the rate on the loan. But another thing that really stood out to me from this report is the sales expectations in the next six months. That rose three points to 60. And any number that is higher than 50 really signals a good market. So that really does signal that they are confident about this market, that there will be some rebound and some turnaround ahead. I'm sure even without those incentives, people trying to jump into that market. Appreciate our very own Danny Romero. Right, well, Russian space weapons are worrying American officials, according to reports. This comes after the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, issued an ominous warning on X, formerly known as Twitter, saying information concerning a serious national security threat has been made available to the committee and requesting President Biden to declassify all information. To break down what this means for us, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Rick Newman. And Rick, when this crossed, there was a lot of, you know, what's going <laughs> yeah, on, what are the yeah. details we're missing here? Fill us in. Yeah, and then there was a lot of reporting uh, what, what exactly is he talking about? And apparently uh, he's referring to something, some new information about Russian space weapons. Hmm. Now, um, the, the idea of space weapons is not new. This dates to the Cold War, to the space race. And uh, for reference, I covered the Pentagon in the 1990s and I, uh, for a magazine. And I wrote a cover story back then about space wars and what was all going on. So the basic idea here is um, there are tons of assets in space for intelligence gathering. GPS is a big deal. And there are always new things going on here. So what we don't know exactly what Russia is doing, but think about what we know is new in space. First of all, in the uh, Ukraine-Kosovo war, we know that a commercial company, uh, uh, SpaceX, uh, has satellites up there that Ukraine is using the, the Starlink system for battlefield communication. So is Russia thinking about doing something to take out those satellites? Are they thinking about launching some kind of space weapon? One of the things you could do, I mean, this, is, this goes all the way into science fiction, is you could uh, detonate a nuclear weapon in space, which would have um, catastrophic effects on the GPS system and a lot of other things. Um, so this one member of Congress, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, seems to think this is extremely worrisome. You got different messaging coming out of the White House. They were, they were kind of like, this is not an urgent problem. Nobody needs to freak out. Um, so he wanted to draw, to draw attention to this. And I don't think we know exactly what made him want to do that. So, Rick, when you have more private companies coming into this space, how does this complicate it when you have, obviously, national powers in the middle of a conflict, but then you also have Starlink and, and others who are also at play here? 
uh, it, it, just, it just broadens the potential problem. I mean, I think there must be thousands of satellites orbiting the planet at this point. Um, most of them are commercial, but there are also military satellites there. So um, it's hard to know like what exactly the state of the technology is. I mean, you could, it, and this is all very classified, I'm sure. And by the way, United States develops this technology too. So could you shoot a laser at a satellite to disable it and just sort of target satellites one at a time? Or do we not have that capability? So in order, if you want to knock out, uh, you, you know, if you wanted to knock out the US GPS system, which the US military relies on, if there were a war with China even, um, you might think about doing that, but then you might all, then you're also knocking out the GPS system for yourself. Mm. Um, and um, just if you knocked out the GPS system, uh, I mean, it would just be an unholy mess because all commercial shipping um, of all types, all commercial transportation relies on GPS. So this is, uh, you know, this is one of those threats that I know in the military establishment, there are a lot of people lose sleep over, um, but on the other hand, the capabilities, or at least the intention to develop the capabilities, have been there for a long time. And I think mostly anybody who would contemplate this realizes that they might have as much to lose or more to lose if they were to attack somebody else's uh, assets in space. So it's a bit of a head scratcher, but you can really go down a rabbit hole on this one. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Rick, we're going to be keeping tabs on this one, as we know you will. We'll see if there's an official response that gets made from the White and House. Hopefully too. nothing happens. Hopefully nothing happens. <laughs> all right. We got some shipments on the way here. Rick, appreciate it. <laughs> We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The retail sector is in focus today after January sales declined more than Wall Street expected, drawing concerns about the health of the consumer as the Fed tries to get inflation down to its 2% target. Now, the consumer has remained relatively resilient for much of the Fed's tightening cycle. Could we now see a pivot as we see rates stay higher for longer? Here with more is Anthony Chakumba, Loop Capital Markets Managing Director. Good to have you on the show here. So, Anthony, break down for us what your biggest takeaways were from this retail number. So I wouldn't read too much into the retail number, um, particularly given the fact that retail sales were very strong um, throughout um, 2023. I mean, you know, this could be just uh, a bit of a, you know, sort of digestion period uh, after, you know, a fairly strong holiday selling season. But, you know, I'm low to read too much into one uh, months of retail uh, sales numbers, uh, particularly given, you know, the strong uh, macroeconomic data that we've seen um, throughout 2023 and even into early 2024. I mean, it seems like there was a good year over year change in one particular area that you do cover and, and one area that we're excited to talk to you about, which is kind of this little luxuries, the, the business of self-care Saturdays or Sundays, whichever day people decide to do that. And, and you've got to call out on one retailer here, Ulta. Take us into the thesis here and, and the little luxuries trade. Is it still holding up strong? There's no question about that. Now, you know, look, it's it's a little ironic because we did just downgrade uh, Ulta to a hold from a buy rating, but that was really based on valuation. It wasn't really based on fundamental concerns uh, at all. Um, look, Ulta actually pre essentially, well, not pre-announced, but they gave some preliminary 2024 guidance when they reported their third quarter results, which is kind of a bold move. I mean, they didn't really have to do that until they reported fourth quarter. And they are expecting comp store sales growth and pretty healthy uh, 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 pro, uh, operating margins. And I think a big part of that is, is like is like what you said. I mean, people really want to kind of pamper themselves. And I think in a lot of cases, um, investors think that beauty products are a lot more discretionary, quite frankly, that they, that they really are, particularly for Ulta's, you know, sort of uh, beauty enthusiast customer base. So we still, even though we downgraded the stock, we still have a pretty strong uh, fundamental outlook on Ulta going to 2024. And Anthony, I want to ask you about some of the, the big ticket items, which, of course, brings in Best Buy. When markets were pricing in, you know, more rate cuts coming earlier, you know that this is something that would benefit one of these big box stores like Best Buy as potentially people decide to move house, have a few more options here. How much does the picture change from here? It definitely changes. I mean, I think, you know, if we were having this conversation 30, 45 uh, days ago, I think the consensus expectations that the rate cuts would start in March. Now it's looking more like, you know, May, particularly given the inflation reading that we got that was a little bit um, higher than we expected. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it will likely push back um, rate cuts um, and, and, and we're looking for rate cuts to help with, you know, mortgage rates, which will then help existing home sales, which then help, um, you know, consumer electronics uh, or sorry, appliance sales, also consumer electronics sales. So, it does kind of push things back. Certainly. And where for Best Buy, how does that hamper the turnaround story that, that you were banking on here for 2024? Well, I mean, I think turnaround is is kind of a strong word. I mean, you know, look, I mean, in terms of doing the th controlling what they can control, they're doing a good job of that. I mean, the only thing that really kind of needs to turn around is is top line, um, and and yeah, unfortunately, that's not necessarily within their control. That is more macro driven. So yeah, as I said, um, you know, if 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 we have a pushback in terms of uh, lower interest rates and that pushes back, uh, you know, a housing market recovery, you know, that's not necessarily a great thing for Best Buy. Are you seeing more kind of broadly Best Buy needing to implement a pricing mechanism to, to actually make sure that they're churning through or, or just moving through inventory that's been sitting and, and perhaps stale? Uh, I mean, Best Buy, like I said, they're doing a great job of controlling what they can control, um, and they're really good at controlling their inventory. So we're not seeing them having to do any uh, sort of unusual discounting uh, to work through inventories. I mean, I think that they've they've been pretty good at at at, at managing their, their their inventories. And you know, and, and look, when it comes to consumer electronics, there always is um, a, a greater degree of inventory management that you have to do. Um, you know, just to manage the end of product life cycles. Right? There's always going to be a new TV coming out to replace the old TVs. Um, but that's something that, they, that they're pretty good at doing. That's not a concern for me um, whatsoever. And we know that consumers have been pulling back on those big ticket items. But what about some of these some of these uh, cheaper brands here? If you like a five below or a dollar tree here, are we still seeing some pullback there as well? 
So, um, I mean, given the fact that the consumer, even though the macroeconomic, um, you know, sort of indicators and variables are fairly strong, the consumer still has this sort of almost like ongoing dread. And I think part of that is just the fact that even though inflation is coming down, we did have, you know, a couple of years of elevated inflation rates. And so they're still looking to stretch their dollar. And yeah, and one way that they can do that is going to a five below is going to um, a dollar tree. And so, you know, we are seeing that trade down from from higher priced um, retailers to those, you know, sort of what we refer to as deep discounters. And and we expect that to continue, um, you know, certainly um, early in 2024. Well, one of the things that's awesome about the work that you and your team at Loop do is you, you do your own price comps as well at discount stores. Where for consumers out there that are trying to figure out just where is the best place to buy? Where am I actually getting the, the best deal from a retailer, what, what have you seen in market, in channel checks? Yeah, so I mean, generally, um, the low price leaders continue to be Walmart uh, on the brick and mortar side and Amazon on the e-commerce side. Now, having said that, a lot of the companies that I uh, cover they have kept their prices very, very competitive. So, I'll, you know, for example, um, you know, you mentioned uh, Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree owns Family Dollar, and then there's, you know, Dollar General as well. Um, and what we have found is that Family Dollar and Dollar General prices, they're not quite at price parity with Walmart, but they're usually sort of a low single digit to a mid single digit percentage higher than Walmart. And that's all they kind of really that they need to be, quite frankly, because, you know, it is kind of a different purchase occasion. It's kind of a midweek um, shopping trip. So, you know, a person's just not going you know, trudge all the way out to Walmart, you know, to save, you know, a low to mid single digit percentage, particularly on a, you know, $15 um, basket size. Um, Amazon, like I said, is the is the is the leader in terms of online. But, you know, going back to Best Buy, you know, what we have found is that Best Buy, you know, is usually within one or two percent of Amazon and Best Buy also will price match um, Amazon. So, you know, price transparency is as high as it's ever been, right? Everyone has a smartphone. It's really easy to compare prices. You don't have to, you know, drive from store to store to do that. Um, uh, so it is incumbent on retailers to make sure that even if they're not the low price leader, they're at least price competitive uh, mm -hmm. or within fitting distance of the low price leader. And you did mention some of the some of the, the issues that tend to be raised around inventory, clearly in a very different place than we were three or four years ago. Which of these deep, deep discounters you think are doing a better job with inventory management? I mean, they're all doing a pretty good job of in inventory management. We really don't see any um, gluts of inventory like, like, you know, like we did. And, you know, and, and remember with the deep discounters, I mean, a lot of what they're selling are consumable. Um, a lot of it's being, you know, sourced um, domestically. So, um, you know, th they, they didn't have a lot of the issues that other retailers did when the, you know, ports got all, um, you know, sort of jacked up, you know, uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic due to the pandemic. So you know, they, they will do a pretty good job of managing their inventories. We don't we don't see a lot of inventory gluts, quite frankly. Usually, you know, the problems that we sometimes see from an operational perspective is that they don't have a, enough inventory, right? Like we see out of stocks. That's been a you know major problem, you know, pretty well documented for Dollar General, for example, and something that they're trying to clean up. Anthony, always a pleasure to get some of your insights and perspective, especially around this entire space. Anthony Chikumba joining us here this morning. Appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks. U.S. retail sales declined more than expected in January, as we've been discussing here this morning, posting steepest declines since March of last year. The drop in retail sales raising questions of whether Americans' resilient consumer may be losing steam. Joining us now to discuss this and much more, we've got Michelle Meyer, who is the MasterCard Economics Institute chief U.S. economist. Michelle, always a pleasure to get some of your time as well here. So walk us through how you're evaluating this resiliency of the consumer from the MasterCard perspective and, and where we can expect that con to continue. And with a reading like today, if it's just a blip as we've been trying to wrap our heads around or if there's something under the water at play. Sure, I think you have to look at the trend in consumer spending, not just one month of data. And the trend has been one where consumers are still very much out there spending. And remember, the January report is coming off of what ended up being a robust holiday shopping season, particularly at the very end of the calendar year, um, which showed consumers that I think resilient, yes, but empowered is potentially even a more descriptive word to, to explain how consumers are feeling right now, which is they have a lot of choices. They're choosing when they spend, how much they want to spend, what they want to spend on, because you have a more normal inventory environment and you're seeing big gyrations in terms of inflation rates by different categories. 
And Michelle, where are you seeing most consumers determined not to pull back? As we talked about sort of down trading and other things, where are the, the stickier yes. parts of this picture? So probably the stickiest um, or where consumers have been the most excited to spend has been for these experiences and particularly for things like concerts, sporting events. We recently did what we think is a pretty cool study on how Taylor Swift impacted the economy and not just on the aggregate, which a lot of people talked about, but given our unique insights, we were able to look at how the concerts impacted the local economies by sector, by zip code. And we found in the areas in the 20 cities that she toured in the US last year, Spending on restaurants within a two and a half mile radius of the stadium was up somewhere around 70%, with some markets up higher, as high as 170% increase. So that shows a consumer that has had the ability to spend. They have been able, again, and willing to spend more for certain items. Um, but it's that same consumer that will walk into a store and look for that promotion or be careful of how they deploy their money. So how does that kind of impact the outlook for 2024, if you think about the experience economy, where spring yeah. break, where summer, where that's spending, especially facing some tough comps from 2023 yeah. and the year that was the Renaissance tour, the year that was the Eras tour, uh, and of course, all of us going to see Barbie and Oppenheimer, or whether or not we actually wanted to see Oppenheimer. At the end of the day, that was a lot uh, of experiential spending that we yeah. did. How is it expected to comp up to that? Well, I think you touched on something important, which is comps, right? It's a year over year change. And 2023 was defined as a big bounce off the bottom. Um, so it's harder to bounce now. But from a level perspective, I do think you're going to continue to see some robust spending in those categories. It's probably going to be big picture, right? When you look at the basket of spend, though, it's going to be a bit of a convergence. Um, in spending uh, versus 2023, where there was a very extreme bifurcation in the basket. And part of that is because of these price differentials. So when you look at the real consumer spending trajectory for the consumer, for certain things like housing related items or durable goods, where there's been a lot of price discounting, you might actually see real units increase. Whereas in those categories where prices are still very high, where you're seeing some stealthflation, if consumers are not as willing to accept that, you could see some reduction in real spending for those categories. So, Michelle, as we continue to see consumers, as you mentioned in this note here, balancing prices and priorities, how does this yeah. change then as we perhaps will at some point this year, later on in this year, see a Fed rate cut kick in? Well, a Fed rate cut would be very helpful, of course, in terms of thinking about how much money they have to put towards debt service. So as the Fed starts to ease, cut interest rates, it's going to provide a support for those categories that are more interest rate sensitive. So even think about today, this morning, you've got retail sales, but we also got the Home Builder Confidence Survey, which picked up and has been rising now for the last several months, which shows that home builders are getting more confident about the fact that interest rates have come down. There's still a low level of supply of homes and they you know, are starting to plan for greater construction and upturn in that cycle. So an easing of monetary policy does provide support for the broader economy. And I would argue probably the most important factor to dictate how the consumer fares this year is really the health of the labor market, which is holding up really nicely. Just lastly, while we've got you, Michelle, in travel spending, what are the anticipations that we're seeing as we kind of look out to the rest of this year? Sure. So just like you've seen the consumer engage in terms of experiences broadly, whether that's Taylor Swift, Beyonce, et cetera, um, you are also seeing a consumer who's been really eager to travel. If you look at the last summer season, this last year's season, consumers really embraced traveling abroad. The dollar was strong. That facilitated that. Um, and I think many of those dimensions are still in play, but you do have to consider this year over year comp. It's going to be harder to see these extraordinarily impressive year over year growth rates. So look at it both from a level and a growth rate to put that into perspective. Now, of course, in terms of how people plan on paying for these, these experiences and everything else, continuing to mm -hmm. see not just credit card debt, but also some, some of the defaults are also starting to pick up there. How do you balance that when you're thinking about the strength of the consumer and how they're spending and funding their experiences? Sure. So I think you want to look at the household balance sheet holistically um, in the sense of how much debt is being taken on in the context of how much wealth has been created. And if you look at measures of net worth from the Federal Reserve, 
we're so close to, you know, the highs that we've seen of this cycle and, and actually in recent history. So the household balance sheet is, is, is so healthy on aggregate. And that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and overall income creation is still um, looking solid. So you have to consider all these different metrics um, rather than just necessarily pointing out one um, particular figure. Um, and again, I think it goes back to the labor market. It's the flow of income that drives spending um, and drives debt service and all the other decisions that the consumer has to make right now. Indeed, and with a low unemployment rate, that continues to be the case. I appreciate yeah. you taking the time to join us. Michelle Meyer, MasterCard Economics Institute Chief US Economist. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, we've got all your markets actions still ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. Cisco shares falling after slashing its full year guidance and announcing layoffs that will impact 5% of its workforce, amounting to about 4,000 employees. CEO Chuck Robbins said in the company's earnings call that the current macro environment is leading them to be more cautious with forecasts and expectations. William Kerwin, Morningstar Equity Analyst, joins us now. William, just want to start out with your, your broad read on this quarter overall. And if this turnaround story is going to be able to be mounted, I mean, we're... we're talking about one to two quarters potentially of, you know, some volatility. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. So really when we see Cisco's near term, we see it as weak. And really we view this in the context of the last few years. We see it as a hangover in demand after surging networking spending in years post pandemic. 
So we see the near term is weak. We were already expecting that, but after the report last night, we actually think it's going to look a good amount worse than we had previously been, been expecting. So we cut our fair value estimate to $50 a share. But overall, when you mentioned you know, the opportunity for a rebound, we still like Cisco's long-term competitive position. We like its focus on profitability, cash flow, and that funds a really good dividend. So we're not worried about the long-term. The short-term definitely looks weaker, um, but we see shares as fairly valued right now. And clearly trying to make some efforts here in terms of cutting 5% of its workforce, trying to streamline spending here. How much of a trajectory are you seeing, though, as to when you think we're going to start seeing this turnaround? You said it's going to be worse, at least for the short term. When does that pick up and what will be that turning point? We think it'll last through 2024, quite frankly. And thereafter, we don't necessarily forecast a snapback, so to speak, in demand, but more so a return to what is typically low single digit growth for Cisco. And that's all that we need to see for our thesis to bear out. And so with the demand environment that we're seeing right now, because that was interesting to hear on the call as well. I mean, this is a company that's going to be making even more investments in its service. But at the end of the day, too, the demand environment seems like that is showing some significant cracks there. What most notably would you be watching for to signal that we've seen a trough in that demand environment and that they're able to rebuild as well? Ultimately, we just need to see an improvement in orders for Cisco. You know, the demand environment is tough, but the sky is also not falling here. You know, we're forecasting now an 8% decline in fiscal 24, which is somewhat alarming for Cisco, but still represents, you know, a high base from which they can grow into the future. But we want to see those orders go back to growth. It's been, you know, four quarters of order declines now. So we're hoping to see those come back to growth in the later part of 2024. And that should hopefully be a leading indicator for sales to return to growth in 2025. And I wanted to get your take on, they talked about the pending acquisition of Splunk on the call as well. How does that play into their bigger ecosystem here? Splunk is really a doubling down on software and also security for Cisco. So Cisco's security business has been lagging the market for you know, almost as long as I can remember. And so this is an investment in that business to build out their portfolio, build out their offering, and improve their overall you know, comprehensive portfolio around security. We like the deal. We think it's a fair price. So we saw it as value neutral for Cisco, but you know, definitely a positive that they moved up the closing expectation into next fiscal quarter. For the past, feels like, four trailing earnings periods, we've heard companies hit the AI button. Can AI save Cisco? The short answer is no here. Uh, Cisco will play into AI a little bit, but we don't think it's a needle mover for the company. Cisco really excels in campus networks, in on-premises data centers, smaller scale networks that sit below the size of these public cloud providers that we see making a lot of the investments in AI right now. So Cisco is trying to make inroads into that market. We think it'll have moderate success there, but ultimately the needle mover is those campus and on-premises networks. And again, you know, our long-term thesis revolves around those, not necessarily being an AI big time winner. And they also did mention their weak demand with their telco and cable service provider customers as well. Is that going to be a continued downtrend? Again, I would say so for the rest of the year, ultimately. These are Cisco's larger customers, those cloud providers that I mentioned. We see them as having a relatively weaker position there compared to large enterprises, for example. And so we see a lot of the weakness in the near term here being driven by those customers. And I expect that to continue through the rest of the year. Well, certainly the share price taking a bit, of, a bit of a hit there this morning on that on that earnings call. Appreciate you joining us this morning. William Kerwin, Morningstar Equity Analyst. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we've got all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
An OpenAI chairman and a former Google executive joined forces to create a new artificial intelligence company that is Sierra. I'm joined by Brett Taylor and Clay Bavor, the co-founders of Sierra, to discuss why they bet big on AI chatbots. Uh, Brett, it has been a while. Nice to see you again in a box. And Clay, nice to meet you uh, for the first time. Now, uh, Brett, Brett, it's great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, uh, Brett, let me start with you because 24 hours this news has been out and I've just been ingesting a lot of some of the early reviews on what this is and what this isn't. What do you say to those that said, hey, you know what, this is this is a customer service bot. Tell me why it's not. Uh, Brian, I think it's so much bigger than that. I look at ChatGPT, grew to 100 million users faster than any consumer product in history. I think it really represents a sea change in consumer behavior. And Clay and I really believe that conversational AI is going to be the way companies interact with their customers in the future. Uh, if you look at 1995, to exist digitally, you needed a website. 2005, maybe you had a profile page in social media. 2015, maybe you made a mobile app. We believe that your AI agent, an AI version of your company that can simply have a conversation with your customers may dwarf all of those in terms of their importance to your brand. And Sierra, we want to be the platform that every company in the world uses to build their AI agent. Clay, there's a lot of this new AI uh, sweeping through in markets. Investors are getting hit with a lot of these things. What are some of the technical challenges from your standpoint to bring a product like this to market? Because the way a lot of folks like me see it, every day there's some new form of AI floating around. Well, we're running towards one of the most challenging and we think potentially impactful problems in AI, which is putting AI directly in front of your customers. And in order to do that, we're taking a pretty differentiated technical approach called an autonomous AI agent architecture. And what that means is that rather than our AI agents using a single AI model, we actually combine multiple models in any action that it takes, for instance, it may call four or five, even six separate models for decision making, reasoning, checking to make sure an answer is factual and more. So we combine this architecture with a layered approach to uh, improving quality, reliability, factuality, and more. And the results have been really promising. Clay, look, I'm, I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, I didn't learn how to code in school, uh, full stop. But as this becomes more powerful, this bot, what will it be doing six months from now that's not doing today? Well, we're really proud to have worked with uh, four of what we call design partners. Think of them as early pilot customers to actually deploy this technology in the wild today. And so we've worked with the likes of Weight Watchers, Sonos, SiriusXM, and Olakai to deploy our platform and build AI agents for them. And what we see it doing today is not just answering questions, but actually taking action on behalf of their customers, processing complex exchanges and returns for the retailer, managing subscriptions and giving advice on things like food points in the case of Weight Watchers. And with Weight Watchers, it's already resolving almost 70% of all customer inquiries and with a remarkable 4.6 out of five-star customer satisfaction. And so over the next six months, we hope to improve the quality and breadth of the types of actions it can take on behalf of customers. And we're seeing great progress on that front. Uh, Brett, the last time I, I physically saw you was on the ground at the World Economic Forum uh, in Davos when you were still co-CEO uh, of Salesforce. And AI was still on the fringes. But now you're out with something like this. And I was thinking back to a couple weeks ago when, when I was there again. And there's a lot of discussion on the future of AI and potential risks. When I see a product like this from Sierra, I, this has to impact jobs, right? Short term, AI definitely has potential for some job displacement. And fundamentally, if you talk to an economist, they'll talk about driving productivity into the economy. And that can often be a euphemism for displacing jobs in the short term. However, if you look back at the history of technology, when the automated teller machine was introduced at banks, it didn't over time reduce the number of employees at banks. There's just different types of jobs. So short term, uh, certainly AI will displace some types of jobs. I think it will also create new types of jobs. Uh, one really great anecdote is actually at one of our design partners, the customer experience teams that were responsible for reporting defects and shaping their AI agent have now renamed themselves the AI architects. And I'm hopeful that categories like AI architect will end up new types of jobs. And most importantly, I'm really hopeful that people can make transitions in the middle of their career to these new types of roles. And companies like Sierra have a big part in playing in that reskilling revolution. Uh, 
Bert, I think you just dated all of us. I think we're all about the same age by calling an automated teller machine. I mean, for, for the younger folks out there on Yahoo Finance, I mean, just an ATM, right? you just get your money out of it, or I don't know, you just use Venmo. But anyway, now Brett, you're also, uh, you're on the, also the chairman of, uh, of OpenAI. I know you're on the governance perspective, but you know, we've seen reports recently that, that Sam Altman wants to raise five to seven trillion. I've been doing this for a while, man. I've never even heard of numbers like this before. What, what is the ultimate grand vision for OpenAI that it would need trillions of dollars of, of capital? I don't even know where that comes from. Well, uh, OpenAI is a mission-driven nonprofit, and the mission is really simple, to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. And that question is probably better for Sam, but what I can tell you is that to produce artificial general intelligence that does benefit all of humanity, it requires the greatest researchers in the world, and it requires a huge build out in infrastructure. And uh, I'm sure any uh, artificial intelligence executive you'll talk to will talk about the current shortage in both training computation and inference computation. It's not an issue specific to open AI. And I think as you look at the build out in the semiconductor space, uh, even companies like Sierra, we've actually had to architect our platform to insulate our customers from potential shortages in, in computation. So it's a huge issue in the industry right now. And I think if you just zoom out a little bit. The numbers are, are comically large. Um, it's because of the promise of this technology. Uh, you know, I think if you look at, if you talk to an economist about the purpose of software, it's really to drive productivity. With large language models and modern AI, I think we have a technology that can truly drive productivity into all segments of the economy. And I think there's really authentic excitement about it. Um, as, as I mentioned, I think to a colleague yesterday, probably a little bit of froth right now, you know, maybe the excitement's really high. I think we'll look back and say that it's warranted though. I think this technology can really impact our personal and professional lives and just remarkable ways. Clay, last, last word to you. What do you think the, you know, you just heard what Brett said, and what do you think the, the moonshot is here with, uh, with this type of technology, and, and where do you see it? Uh, or how do you see it impacting, you know, humanity over the next decade? We really think of conversational AI, AI as a sea change technology with huge implications on not only how people interact with computers and businesses, but in how businesses represent themselves. And as Brett said, we really believe that if in 1995, you needed to build a website to represent your company, your business at its best, in 2025, you're gonna need an AI agent. And that's gonna enable you to imbue this thing with your voice and values, enable you to help customers at the highest level of quality any hour of any day. You're never gonna to have to ask your customers to wait and show up as a company as your best self in every digital interaction you have. That's our vision for the company, and we hope to make Sierra the conversational AI platform for businesses and enable every every company to bring this type of experience to their customers. Brett, you got to apply this to earnings calls. I mean, doing those are no fun. I bet you're. I'm sure you're happy enough to be on those anymore, right? Uh, I'm happy to talk to you, <laughs> not just after Salesforce earnings calls. Uh, going from 80,000 employees to 30 is really fun. I. I said this yesterday, but one of my favorite quotes, I don't know if it's misattributed as Steve Jobs, it's more fun to be a pirate than it is to be in the Navy. And so uh, Clay and I are, are sailing this pirate ship into the ocean and I've never had more fun. All right, well, ahoy mates. Uh, Brett Taylor and Clay Bavar, Sierra co-founders, good to see you both and uh, good luck on the new venture. We'll, uh, we'll be tracking it. Thanks so much, Brian. All right, got, uh, we're looking ahead to NVIDIA earnings next week. Speaking of all, all things AI, here's a look at what investors can expect. NVIDIA is Wall Street's AI darling. The company's stock price is a massive bull run, rocketing 380% since the end of 2022, and was the best performing component of the S&P 500 in 2023. With that said, here are three things we'll be watching for when the chip giant announces its fourth quarter earnings on February 21st. Artificial intelligence. NVIDIA is the tech industry's go-to provider for the powerful graphics processing units used to train and run generative AI models. Heck, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that his company will purchase an incredible 350,000 NVIDIA H100 cards by the end of 2024 at a price tag well into the billions of dollars. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Tesla, you name it, every company is clamoring for NVIDIA's chips. And those are just the tech giants. Smaller firms are also working to get their mitts on NVIDIA's offerings. And with the earnings season already showing continued AI investment across the tech industry, NVIDIA stands to continue to gain considerably. Market expectations. Expectations for NVIDIA's fourth quarter are sky high after the company stunned Wall Street in the prior period when revenue rocketed an incredible 206% year over year to 18.12 billion. 
In the fourth quarter, the company is projecting revenue of 20 billion plus or minus 2%, well above analysts' prior expectations of 17.8 billion. And Wall Street doesn't see the growth stopping anytime soon. Bank of America recently raised its price target in NVIDIA from $700 to $800. Goldman Sachs also raised its price target for the company to $800. It previously had a price target of $625 on the stock. Regulation and competition. Still, it's not all smooth sailing for NVIDIA. The company is contending with U.S. export restrictions, blocking the sale of some of its high-end chips to China, one of its largest markets. And while that isn't hurting the company for now, it could mean the chip giant misses out on potential future sales. Then there are rivals. AMD and Intel are slowly but surely building out their own high-powered AI chips, with AMD in particular gaining on NVIDIA's tail. That company says its latest MI300X chip can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with NVIDIA's H100, a claim NVIDIA refuted via a blog post. Even NVIDIA's own customers, including Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla, are building out their own AI chips, which could cut into the total addressable market for third-party AI chips. Still, those threats are relatively distant at this point. NVIDIA is still riding high at the moment, and we'll find out if it can keep the hype train rolling when it reports its results February 21st. Small business owners are feeling optimistic about growth in 2024 after ending the year prior on a high note. 85% say that they are satisfied with the success of their business in 2023, and 86% say they achieved those business goals. That's all according to a new American Express survey. For more on this, let's bring in Brett Sussman, who is the American Express Business Blueprint Small Business Banking Vice President and Head 
of marketing. Great to have you here with us today. All right, so take us into some of the, the small business sentiments that we're hearing right now and, and where this kind of where this kind of pairs against 2023 in terms of the outlook for 2024. Yeah, according to the latest data from the American Express Trend X, small business owners are feeling optimistic and they're feeling resilient in the face of inflation and the macroeconomic economy. And I think that really stems from their feeling of stability this year in 2024 that is in contrast to the volatility and some of the rapid shocks that they've seen in other years. And something I, that I honed in on here, 46% of the largest small businesses, that's with between 101 and 500 employees, reported hiring as one of their top goals. Because I know we talk about the, what we're seeing with the labor market here. How much are they prioritizing this and what sort of spending are they potentially looking at as we still just barely see some of the wage pressures declining a little? Yeah, and I think that goes in hand in hand with another stat, which is 50% of small businesses said they're looking to proactively grow. And that's to increase locations, offer new products and services, and to grow, they're gonna need employees. And so it really is very focused on this hiring aspect. And one of the more interesting aspects of this is they're using a lever of a flexible work environment to try to attract employees. And that's usually the domain of the largest businesses. Well, that now is a tactic that smaller businesses are using to stand out in this labor market. And from the data that you've been able to gather here, how are small businesses evaluating the interest rate environment and, and how they plan to navigate potential cuts and what that would potentially mean for their businesses? Yeah, you know, one of the biggest factors that small businesses think about is inflation and the impact on pricing strategies. And so that's one of the top things that they're focused on is their pricing strategies. And over the last few years, they've really grappled with how much of the price gains can they give to their consumers without someone moving to a different business or maybe a larger business. And so I think they're feeling much more confident in the stability of inflation this year. And so then when you think about them leaning into AI, which is something that we continue to see a lot of these companies do, when you're a small business, what sort of inflows are you seeing into that part of the business versus, say, hiring individuals as a way to boost productivity? Yeah. I think the other aspect that small businesses are is, is always hyper focused on efficiency and how can the tools that the bigger guys get bring it to the smaller businesses. So about 40 percent are actually using AI today. They are a very AI curious bunch and about a third cited that this is one of the biggest opportunities in 2024 for them. But it really is focused on making their existing employees more efficient. So the biggest use cases really are around marketing, and that is really personalizing the message, taking out more versions in social media and customer service. So that may be speaking to customers over email or over chat. And it really is about an efficiency play as they both hire and get more out of their existing employees. Brett, just lastly, while we have you, I got to hustle to my finish here, but how are small businesses evaluating the employment situation and, and how are their hiring plans stacking up? Yeah, I think as early hiring is a is a big theme for 2024. The largest small business again, 46% think that they're going to hire, and they're really trying to, as I said, stand out with the environment of small business and also the mission. Small businesses are critically important to the communities they live in. People want to work for them. People want to go to small businesses. So I think that's a factor that really makes them stand out from an employer perspective. All right, American Express's Brett Sussman. I didn't know we'd be twinning today, but here we are, twinning. Thank you so much for taking the time. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time today. Indeed, indeed. Time, everyone, for a quick check of the markets as we round out this hour. We're taking a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. We've got them pulled up in big numbers here for you on your screen so you can see it and so I can see it, too. The Dow and the S&P 500, both in positive territory. The Dow up by about four-tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ, though, the lone laggard that's down by about two-tenths of a percent for a tech-heavy average here. That does it for myself and Rochelle Akufo and the entire team for the 9 to 11 hours. But, hey, guess what? We've got a fresh hour coming your way with the Kiko Fujita. Stick around.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita, and here's what I'm watching. The market striving to build momentum as investors digest the latest batch of retail sales data, a pullback by consumers, raising questions on what the outlook for growth will look like this year. And checking in on travel, companies like Expedia and Airbnb pointing to travel demand moderating. But one analyst says the sector has opportunities for investors. And turning to earnings, Croc shares rising after the company delivers a better than expected 2024 profit guidance. We're going to dig into the footwear company's upbeat quarter later this hour as we see that stock move up more than 7%. First, though, let's do a broader check of where the markets are right now. Remember, stocks still trying to claw back from that big sell-off we saw earlier in the week. The Dow is up 174 points right now. The S&P 500 up 8 and the Nasdaq down 31. So a bit of a split picture there as we look at trade 90 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at where yields are trading right now on the back of that weaker than expected retail sales data. We are seeing the five-year yield uh, down 4.2% there, or 10-year yield at 4.23% and the 30-year yield at 4.42%. Well, sticky inflation is presenting the largest problem for President Joe Biden's re-election this year. Meanwhile, the scarring effects of inflation may be leaving Americans nostalgic for the former president's economy. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman to discuss more. Rick. Hey, Kiko. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been getting lots of anecdotal feedback from people uh, writing in and contacting me on social saying, come on, you know, uh, the economy did better under Trump than under Biden. This is showing up in polls. Uh, voters definitely say they trust Trump more than Biden on the economy. So I just went into the data to figure out, well, is that true or not? Um, and looked at inflation, which, of course, is the biggest thing that's on people's mind. And yeah, it is true. So uh, under Biden so far, we've had three years under Biden. So we compared Biden's first three, first three years with Trump's first three years. Total inflation under Biden under three years is around 17 percent. Under Trump, it was only 6 percent. Uh, earnings under Biden are up by more than they were under Trump, uh, but they're actually not up by as much as inflation. So people are falling behind in terms of the purchasing power of their paycheck. And under Trump, earnings were up by a little bit more than inflation. And uh, if you get into different categories, uh, I've been tracking 26 key categories uh, since 2001 and seeing how inflation is going there. The things that matter most to people, uh, groceries, rent, transportation, yes, they're up by uh, more under Biden than under Trump. There is a little bit of a surprise. Under Biden, um, three things are up less than they were under Trump. That is health care, prescription drugs, and college tuition. Definitely important for people have to, uh, who have to deal with those things. Uh, but we've got the, you know, we've got the data. So this is this is the problem that Joe Biden has to deal with. The trend is it going his direction because inflation, as we've been talking about quite a lot, is getting better. Um, the question is, will it improve enough uh, during the next uh, nine months before people vote that they're going to say, OK, things are good under Biden? And just one last thing I will add, Akiko. So this story went out late yesterday, and I've been getting a lot of feedback on it. And some people are, are saying, hey, I'm actually better off under Biden than Trump. I don't agree with your premise. So there are those people out there who say, I'm doing pretty well right now, and I'd like to stick with the way things are. Uh, Rick, you know, f for the president, I mean, I guess the story is the improvement, right, that, that, that at least the White House wants to sell. If you think about inflation, where it was a year ago, how it's come down, how the job market has been resilient, how do they tie that directly to the White House when voters are, are so skeptical and really down on the economy despite the data we've gotten? Yeah, I mean, as we are learning, it's a really tough problem. And I think uh, economists, policymakers, voters, and politicians all forgot how scarring inflation really can be. I mean, we have not had serious inflation since the, uh, since the early 1980s. Uh, and it's almost like it just, it just stopped being a thing. So we are now learning that the, you know, the, big, the big problem that people are expressing is even uh, they do realize that the rate of inflation is coming down. So when the rate comes down, that means we still have inflation. It's prices just going up at a much lower rate than they used to. The problem, as you know, many consumers are 100% aware, is a lot of the things that went up in price are still there. 
They have not dropped back to where they were before we had this bout of inflation. A few things are, uh, you know, we're seeing like used car prices are now starting to come back down, but food prices are not coming back down. They went up and they're staying there. So that's what people see. And that is a direct pocketbook issue. So Biden has a tough message on this. He has to, you know, he keeps talking about the things that are going well in the economy and that is job growth has been terrific. Uh, people, workers are getting raises. We've had GDP growth. I mean, the economy's growing. Those things are all going well, but we now know that that doesn't matter that much when people uh, feel that the purchasing power of their paycheck is being eroded. So Biden is trying to, he's trying to split the difference here. He's been trying to say, you know, emphasize the things that are going right while saying, I understand we have more work to do. Prices are still too high. There's no evidence that's working yet uh, because his approval rating is low and it hasn't ticked up at all. But we still have time and there, you know, we're seeing in consumer confidence surveys, there is some evidence that people are starting to feel better about inflation. Like they realize, they're starting to realize, yeah, it seems to be going away for good. So Biden just needs that trend to continue and start to have some impact on a better approval rating for him. Yeah, it is still February, a ways out here from that November election. Rick Newman, as always, thanks so much See for you, that. Kiko. Well, we are seeing a bit of a split picture in stocks today with that latest economic data raising questions about the strength of the consumer. Retail sales declined 0.8% last month, much more than economists expected. That data coming on a day where two major economies, the UK and Japan, slipped into a technical recession. To discuss what this means for the path ahead for investors, let's bring in Jeffrey Kleintop. Uh, Jeffrey, it's good to talk to you today. You know, how do we look at what's happening globally right now in the context of the economic data that has been relatively strong in the U.S.? Yes, retail sales plunged a little more than expected, but if you look across the board, it feels like there's a bit of a divergence that's happening. There is. And I think the big story of last year and one that might reverse this year is that much of the rest of the world was weaker than the U.S. because of their tie to manufacturing. You see, there was a manufacturing recession last year. We saw it in the Purchasing Managers Index. We saw it in factory output. We saw it in trade. In fact, we even saw it in demand for cardboard boxes, the things that uh, manufactured goods and trade go into. Demand for cardboard boxes fell 10 percent last year. That's starting to turn around, though. So economies like Japan, uh, Germany, the UK, very manufacturing-centric economies suffered recessions last year, whereas the US, much more service-oriented. We had Taylor Swift uh, you know, driving a lot of uh, entertainment and travel spending. Uh, the US bucked that trend. But now we're seeing a recovery in demand for cardboard boxes, a recovery in the survey of manufacturers. 2024 could be a year where manufacturing uh, turns back into growth territory. That means some of those economies that were very weak last year, two that you just mentioned that slipped into recession, could turn around and grow, maybe even uh, accelerate their, their pace of growth. Uh, growth this year, even as the U.S. begins to slow down. So that could mean a reversal in some of the sector leadership we've seen over the last year. Uh, Jeffrey, you could argue that uh, underlying the strength, the relative strength in the U.S. economy has been the consumer. How big of a concern is this data set that came through today? Yes, it's just one month, but it seems to show there's a bit of a crack that's starting to form. Possible. I, I guess I'd also point out that uh, most U.S. consumers are now piling onto their credit cards in order to support that spending. Uh, they, they've, you know, eclipsed their income gains, and now they're digging into more and more debt. So that's a concern. It limits the maybe extent of that resilience. Uh, and I do worry a little bit about a weakening job market later this year, as we've heard from many business leaders talking about additional uh, headcount reductions. Usually that takes six to nine months to actually flow through. So we could start to see some weakness there in addition to those service industry that are now slowing down in the U.S., we could see some layoffs there. There are 10 times as many jobs and services as manufacturing in the U.S., so that's where we can see that slowdown. And if people feel their jobs are more at risk, maybe they don't borrow as much to sustain that spending. So I do think there's a bit of a slower momentum there for the consumer in the U.S., though maybe not an outright recession. Yeah, Jeff, returning our attention back to international here, I mean, we started by talking about the data, the, the data we got through from Japan slipping now into the fourth largest economy because of that contraction we saw in GDP. And yet I can't help but notice that the Nikkei hitting a 34-year high, largely driven by some of these chip-related stocks. I mean, d does that speak to just the disconnect that we are starting to see between 
the macro landscape and then sort of just the enthusiasm in the markets around very specific sectors? Or is this really just Japan specific? I think with Yeah, I, sorry, I had a little audio uh, difficulty there. Uh, I, I think some of this is Japan-specific in that Japan's economy uh, is very different than its stock market. Japan's uh, companies uh, tend to manufacture and sell uh, 70 80% of their products outside of Japan. So weakness in Japan isn't necessarily tied directly to weakness in revenues or earnings for Japanese companies. But it's, it's worth noting that I think uh, Japan's economy has has shown better signs of growth, or at least its 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 earnings potential here, and some of that uh, may be triggering rate hikes this year by Japan, and that might incentivize more money coming back to Japan, funding more operations as as the currency strengthens, uh, interest rates tick up a little bit there, and that could be good news. In fact, Japan's Ministry of Finance has been showing some data has been money's been coming back to Japan and its stock market uh, this year. Uh, in addition to last year, last year was also a good year for stocks in Japan. So I think Japan is one of those more manufacturing based economies that could see a stronger 2024. Uh, Jeffrey, you've always got a good pulse on you know what's happening globally here. As we talk about Japan, I I'm always cur I'm also curious to hear what you're seeing in Asia broadly. I mean, we've been talking so much about the sell-off, the big declines we've been seeing out of China. Those investors, some would argue, moving over to a market like Japan as well. I mean, how do we sort of connect these moves as China tries to stem the outflow? And yet we see a huge influx of foreign investments, foreign investors coming into the Japanese market. Yeah, uh, that's true. I also went to India as well, which has seen a lot of inflows lately, and, and Indian stocks have done uh, pretty well, and its economy is doing well. So it's, it's interesting. You know, we tend to think of regions as uh, homogenous, but they're not. Uh, China is obviously suffering with a lot of domestic concerns tied to the property markets weighing on its stock market, whereas, uh, you know, Japan now seeing a turn in, in the manufacturing situation, India just picking up business uh, from China uh, as a more uh, ma uh, friendly destination for manufacturing. So we're definitely seeing a, a shift in capital flows and a growth dynamics within Asia. And that makes Asia still a very attractive investment destination. And, uh, I, and people often think of, of if China's slowing down, that's bad for all of Asia. But what we've seen is evidence that that is not the case. And in fact, there are some real uh, investing bright spots. Jeffrey Kleintop, Charles Schwab, Chief Global Investment Strategist, joining us there. Apologies for some audio issues, but I appreciate your time today. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
NVIDIA is Wall Street's AI darling. The company's stock price is a massive bull run, rocketing 380% since the end of 2022, and was the best performing component of the S&P 500 in 2023. With that said, here are three things we'll be watching for when the chip giant announces its fourth quarter earnings on February 21st. Artificial intelligence. NVIDIA is the tech industry's go-to provider for the powerful graphics processing units used to train and run generative AI models. Heck, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that his company will purchase an incredible 350,000 NVIDIA H100 cards by the end of 2024 at a price tag well into the billions of dollars. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Tesla, you name it, every company is clamoring for NVIDIA's chips. And those are just the tech giants. Smaller firms are also working to get their mitts on NVIDIA's offerings. And with the earnings season already showing continued AI investment across the tech industry, NVIDIA stands to continue to gain considerably. Market expectations. Expectations for NVIDIA's fourth quarter are sky high after the company stunned Wall Street in the prior period when revenue rocketed an incredible 206% year over year to 18.12 billion. In the fourth quarter, the company is projecting revenue of 20 billion plus or minus 2%, well above analysts' prior expectations of 17.8 billion. And Wall Street doesn't see the growth stopping anytime soon. Bank of America recently raised its price target in NVIDIA from $700 to $800. Goldman Sachs also raised its price target for the company to $800. It previously had a price target of $625 on the stock. Regulation and competition. Still, it's not all smooth sailing for NVIDIA. The company is contending with U.S. export restrictions, blocking the sale of some of its high-end chips to China, one of its largest markets. And while that isn't hurting the company for now, it could mean the chip giant misses out on potential future sales. Then there are rivals. AMD and Intel are slowly but surely building out their own high-powered AI chips, with AMD in particular gaining on NVIDIA's tail. That company says its latest MI300X chip can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with NVIDIA's H100, a claim NVIDIA refuted via a blog post. Even NVIDIA's own customers, including Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla are building out their own AI chips, which could cut into the total addressable market for third-party AI chips. Still, those threats are relatively distant at this point. NVIDIA is still riding high at the moment, and we'll find out if it can keep the hype train rolling when it reports its results February 21st. From Hollywood blockbusters to theme parks branded as the happiest place on earth, the Walt Disney Company has built itself into an entertainment juggernaut. The media giant generated total revenue of nearly $33 billion in 2023, an increase of about 16% year over year. Beyond the Ticker dives deeper into Disney's success and how it became a household name. In 1923, Walt Disney and his brother Roy established Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio in Los Angeles. Five years later, New York's Colony Theater premiered Steamboat Willie, the first cartoon released with synchronized sound. It also marked the debut of Mickey Mouse. Disney eventually released its first feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, in 1937. The film saw instant success, becoming the highest grossing title of all time to that point. Disney's first theme park came about a decade and a half later, with California's Disneyland opening its doors in July 1955. It was regarded as the first modern theme park in the United States. Two years later, Disney hit the stock market with an initial public offering price of $13.88 a share. In December 1966, Walt Disney died at the age of 65, but his legacy would most certainly live on. Walt Disney World, named in the filmmaker's honor, opened on October 1st, 1971 in Orlando, Florida. But as Disney began to evolve as a company, so did its leadership team, with famed CEO Michael Eisner taking over the position in 1984. In his first four years, Disney surged from last place to first in box office receipts among the eight major studios. In 1996, Disney merged with Capital Cities ABC for $19 billion. At the time, it was the second largest merger in U.S. history. And then the Bob Iger era. Iger succeeded Michael Eisner as CEO in 2005, setting off a chain of events that included a slew of famous acquisitions. Under Iger's leadership, Disney became an equity owner of Hulu and also acquired all of Marvel Entertainment. He led the acquisition of Lucasfilm, coughing up about $4 billion for properties that included Star Wars and Indiana Jones. He also bought 21st Century Fox for about $71 billion and one of the largest media purchases ever. 
Shortly after, the company launched Disney+. Plus. The streaming service officially surpassed Netflix with 221 million total subscribers in 2022. That same year, Bob Iger returned as CEO in a shocking executive shakeup. He had hand-selected Bob Chapek as his predecessor just two years prior, but chose to return amid multiple controversies and a sinking stock price. One of those controversies included a battle with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Following Iger's return, Disney sued DeSantis, accusing him of violating the company's First Amendment rights by utilizing political power for, quote, government retaliation. A federal judge dismissed the lawsuit, determining that Disney's position ultimately lacked standing or the right to sue. Disney has filed a notice of appeal. Although the future remains unclear with proxy battles, linear network declines, profitability struggles, and slowing theme park attendance, Iger appears committed to bringing back Disney's magic. And a quick check of the markets here. We have a mixed board. The Dow is up about four tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 uh, treading water up nine tenths or nine basis points. And the Nasdaq is underwater for one third of a percent. I'd also add that the Russell 2000 up again for over one percentage point. It was up about two percent yesterday after that big downdraft that we saw the day before that. Now, looking at the sector action, we have energy up 1.86%. That is on the back of crude oil, which is up over 1%. Real estate has been an interesting leader all day. Uh, we've also seen some other defensive uh, mixed into the leadership. Materials, though, financials, those are outperforming. And then you get to utilities. So utility is not the leader it had been earlier in the day. And to the downside, we're taking, uh, we're tracking tech. Tech is uh, off by about half a percent. And so let's take a look at what's going on. What jumps out immediately is the mega cap situation. We do have Tesla and Meta up more than 2%. You can see them jockeying for position here as their market caps change in real time. But we have Amazon down about 1.5%, Alphabet down almost 3%. So taking a little bit of a back seat here for most of those issues. And let's get a quick check of the Dow as well. Besides the two tech stocks there, we do see mainly green. JP Morgan up 1%. I was mentioning financials outperforming today. Also seeing Chevron, that's up 2% as well. well we're going to be right back.
Welcome back. The size of mega deals in the Permian Basin have been rapidly accelerating the timeline of oil consolidation. Now, back in October of last year, ExxonMobil announced its $64.5 billion acquisition of Pioneer Natural Resources. And earlier this week, we caught wind of the latest merger, Diamondback Energy and Endeavor Energy Resources. Our next guest says we're entering a new era of unprecedented deal making for the shale sector. Let's bring him in now, Matthew Bernstein, Rystad Energy Senior Analyst. Thank you for joining me this morning. So walk us through what this shale 4.0 sec, uh, season looks like when you have these mergers continuing to come into play. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. Um, so yeah, kind of as you alluded to there, we really do see this as a new era in the shale sector. Um, I think over the past several years, since right before COVID, these operators have been able to prove that they can essentially uh, live within their means or uh, you know invest into uh, new development within their cash flow. Um, so from the investor side and, and the shareholder side, you're seeing a, a bit more easiness and, and a bit more acceptance of things like taking on um, new debt in order to finance acquisitions, because ultimately this Shell 4.0 era will really be um, defined by the need for scale for the long term. And, and that's really the motivation behind all these deals um, is, is really needing to scale up in, in terms of the acreage and the amount of drillable locations that you can have um, for the future, because ultimately this is a, a finite resource. And, you know, there are, um, you know, a general consensus on, on oil demand, at least moving forward for the next decades. So, you know, in shale 4.0, um, these companies are going to want to have the most scale in the most commercial areas. Um, and really, that is the, the core of the Permian Basin. And, and speaking of Diamondback and Endeavor, the Permian Basin, one of the most lucrative oil producing regions here, how much does that change the space here? Yes, yeah, certainly. So, you know, there's there's not a lot of companies out there left um, the same size as Endeavor in terms of the amount of future locations um, that Diamondback's acquiring in that deal. Um, so really, you're you're creating a company, this new Diamondback Endeavor merged firm that is right up there in that top upper echelon um, of inventory holders in the basin. So moving forward, you're going to see more and more um, of that region consolidated by just a few names. Um, and, and it's also going to change the nature of the types of deals that we see in the Permian. Um, as I said, there's not a lot of large private targets out there left. There are a few, um, but what we expect to see in, in kind of the next phase is, is potentially some more um, public to public mergers of equals in order to build scale that way. And which are some of the oil companies that you think could be next uh, ripe for this m and activity? Yeah, so, you know, several operators have uh, effectively um, grown very quickly inorganically in early 2023 um, prior to the Exxon Pioneer deal. So that includes some names like Civitas Resources, um, Vital Energy, Oventive, uh, Permian Resources. Um, and, and these operators were able to acquire um, uh, uh, private operators that were kind of bundled up um, by large private equity groups and then who were looking to exit that investment. Um, so I think as a lot of these companies that I, that I mentioned look to kind of gain scale inorganically um, in the Permian during 2023, I, I think that some of those names could be ripe um, either to be acquired by a, a larger company um, that, that perhaps has, you know, let, stayed out of the deal making so far uh, or potentially merged together and, and uh, you know, create a a formidably sized company in that regard. And what do you think could be some of the headwinds that we could see when it comes to the energy M&A space here? Because obviously we've seen a lot of, of uh, criticism here for some of these big mergers, not so much seeing that though in the energy space. Yeah, you know, if you look at it, uh, obviously the Permian Basin is is the most productive and and really the most economic region within um, the U.S. onshore uh, oil fields. Um, that said, there there are still you know many other areas of uh, very economic oil production. Uh, you have the DJ Basin in Colorado, the the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, uh, the Eagle Ford um, Shale in East Texas. So while a, a lot of the activity for economic reasons is centered in the Permian Basin, um, you know, the these deals aren't necessarily, I'd say, consolidating, um, you know, a, a tremendous share of the entire U.S. oil output in the hands of a few operators. Certainly important context, context to add there. Appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Matthew Bernstein, Rystad Energy Senior Analyst. All right, we've still got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, a slew of travel earnings this week from Airbnb, Expedia, and Marriott, all pointing to a slowdown or moderation in consumer demand. But our next guest says there's still opportunity for investors in the sector. For where to play in the travel space, let's bring in Ron Josie, City Research Internet Analyst. Uh, great to have you on today. Give me your sort of snapshot based on what we've heard from the companies before. Tough to make the comparison to the revenge travel that we saw last year, but maybe not as bad as some people expected. Yeah, no, Kiko, I think you're right. It's uh, it's sort of a, it's a challenging time now because we're coming off of 4Q where from what we heard, October was a challenge given the conflict in the Middle East, but then you heard Airbnb talk about accelerating growth in November and December. You heard Expedia say that you know Verbo continues to be somewhat challenged as they migrate to the new platform, yet by and large, it seems as if consumer travel trend, trends remain healthy. Unemployment is better or is where it is. And, you know, the big question we get constantly is we heard about the summer travel in 22. Would that repeat in 23? The answer was yes. The question is, does that repeat in 24? And frankly, I don't see any signs that would suggest otherwise. And so it seems to me the the market is healthy. We do have some challenging comps overall. Everyone has already taken the trip. But when you have unemployment where it is and, and when you have sort of consumer confidence as high as it is, I, I actually think travel will be just fine. Um, this year. And, and 4Q was a little messy because of the October, the, the conflict in the Middle East. And 1Q gets a little bit messy because Easter is earlier on in the year. But by and large, it seems like travel trends are, are holding up relatively well. Yeah, so let's talk about some strategy here. I mean, booking sure. holdings, your top pick, uh, still waiting for those results to come through. But is it about scale when you think about where to put your money in what is expected to be continued momentum in the travel space, booking is one of those that's got sort of a presence across the stack. Yeah, no, I mean, within the online travel sub-vertical, if you will, booking is our top pick, followed by Airbnb. Um, bigger picture, we we uh, we love Meta, we love Amazon, we love Uber as well, so we can talk about those. But no, um, it is a matter of scale. There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And the more hotels you have in what is increasingly a supply-driven market, um, the more you can generate greater demand. And so booking, you know, having as many hotels as they do in Europe, increasingly in North America and also in Asia Pac, we just think they're amongst the best position to benefit from this continued trend of, of travel. And again, might be a little messy here with where Easter lies in 1Q and given the issues in 4Q, but I think come summertime, I still think booking is amongst the best position. And the thing that booking has, not just the scale in hotels, to your question, it's also the know-how and marketing efficiency on how to really go after those consumers that are willing and able to and want to spend on travel. And, and that's a... Um, that's a superpower that I think booking has that, that everybody wants to emulate. And what's different with Airbnb is, you know, they they talk about 90% of traffic comes direct to their site. And so you, they don't need to advertise as much for performance, i.e. getting that last booker. Rather, they're building up their brand and they do a very good job of that. And, and the last thing I would just say on Airbnb is one of the key takeaways that we heard about um, from Airbnb this last quarter was – they added or they now have 7.7 .7 million listings on their site growing 18%. That, as that supply grows and, and you see travel becoming more intra-region, if you will, I think that's a positive for Airbnb as, as we go through this. Yeah, I mean, that number, when you think about it, 7 million active listings, a, a massive yeah. one. When you think about the presence they have globally, I wonder when you look at a name like Airbnb, though, Yes, there's a travel element in, in, in sort of the demand that you talked about. The overall picture is still strong. How much of that additional tailwind does a name like Airbnb get when you think about why people choose to list on the platform? It, it feels like there is a bit of a bump coming through from those who may not have listed before or who in this environment are saying, maybe I need a little extra income. Maybe I'll consider hosting now. You know, I, I think that's really interesting. And so that 7.7 .7 million number, that's up 18%. Um, I, I think what you're finding is, and you saw this with Airbnb, Airbnb launches products every two main product releases every year, one in the spring and May, one in the fall, winter and November. And these past couple of product releases have been really focused on making it easier to list your 
home. And, and it's not just listing maybe your second home, could be your primary home. There's also newer tools around things like co-hosting, which you might not want to list your home, but you know what? The person down the street does a really good job. You can actually have that person help you list and maybe manage it for you. And so I think just getting greater supply just helps to drive just it brings more traffic to your site and just brings more alternatives. And so then the option becomes, okay, how do you improve that conversion? You have the traffic, you have the supply. And this is where Airbnb, I think, is really excelling with newer tools like guest favorites that's driving the conversion. So internet starts and stops. It could go on, on product innovation and products. And uh, and we're seeing that on Airbnb in, in order to minimize the friction of, of getting more supply on the site but then also making it easier for us to search. And I think that's going to get better as a year progresses and as they launch new Gen AI tools that, that sort of changes how we search for travel. Uh, final question, Ron, because you did mention yeah. Meta and just sort of the broad tech stocks that you're watching right now. Um, you know, th this thing that you said about travel was sort of the scales, sort of the haves, the big players versus the smaller players. Does that also apply to the tech space? You know, when you think about somebody like Meta, when they reported that massive bump that we saw um, in revenue, but also contrasted with the kind of declines we saw in Snap, it feels like that also points to sort of bigger is better in this environment. You know, scale, scale, we've always talked about scale beginning scale. There's no doubt that that absolutely that trend continues. But when it comes to this environment where, you know, we're we're believers that the online advertising market is strengthening. It, it stabilized about a year ago. It improved six months ago, and now we're strengthening. I think that strength is coming. It's not a rising tide. I think that strength is going to those platforms that have the scale and the capability and ability to drive greater return on ad spend for advertisers. And so that's Meta. Increasingly, that's Amazon. Of course, that's Google as well. But Meta is just doing so well. And I think the reason being is when you have that three billion dollar, uh, three billion users, uh, you know, on a monthly basis, you can just target and personalize and, and just really find who you're looking for. Now, the next step is what, what after Meta, where do you go? And, and this is where, you know, we're, we're actually very interested and, and pretty bullish on what Pinterest is doing. They're doing a better job of launching newer products. And so anyway, my point being is, yes, scale begets scale in this market where things are not normal. We're improving and advertising strengthening. I think Meta is call it your, your best pick for advertisers and that return on ad spend continues to improve. So um, it is scale. I agree. Yeah, it certainly proved to be a big tailwind for the stock as well. Uh, Ron Josie, as always, City Research Internet Analyst. It's great to talk to you today. I appreciate the perspective. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Well, Croc shares are climbing higher today after reporting a record high annual profit in 2023 and issuing a solid full year guidance. Joining me now is Sam Poser, Williams Trading Equity Analyst. Um, Sam, what do you think was the biggest driver for uh, the company in the quarter and how much of that momentum can carry through? Well, I mean, they they pre-announced the number about a month and a half ago at a conference. So, so from a revenue perspective, it wasn't really a surprise. So the surprise really came on the gross margin that was better than what, what everybody anticipated. Um, and it looks like the Hey Dude business, uh, people seem to be convinced that the Hey Dude business is going to stabilize. Um, uh, within 2024. So, uh, and the inventories are very clean and their um, leverage ratio is down. So, so, so they're just moving in the right direction. They're more flexible uh, and they're working towards a, a, a much more um, aggressive, uh, working towards a much more aggressive pull model, which will help margins down the road. And I think that's why the stock's reacting because uh, I don't think people quite expected the EPS beat and the guidance from an EPS perspective was higher than what uh, the street anticipated. What are you watching for in terms of additional levers that could push the stock even higher? Yeah, so so one of the things that they've done well, and they talked about it back in January, and they re-mentioned it on the call today, was uh, you know they're going to they're 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 cranking up their SGNA spend, especially on marketing. Uh, long, what they're calling long-term marketing. We believe that the short-term mar short marketing will, uh, the long-term marketing will drive short-term sales, even though that's not included in the guidance. Uh, given where we are in the year for Crocs and for Hey Dude, uh, while well, it's still wintertime, we don't think that we're really going to see that until we get to around Easter. 
um, or maybe just after. That's when we'll see that. And then we think there's upside on the numbers. Uh, but uh, a little too early to tell, but things are moving in the right direction. And especially uh, the inventory is as clean as we've seen it in a long, long time. Uh, finally, Sam, uh, certainly a lot of questions today on the back of the retail sales data about the health of the consumer. You obviously cover a lot of these consumer-facing companies. What is your read on, on where that confidence is right now and how much consumers are willing to continue spending? I mean, how much, how long is that runway? You're not going to like my answer. Um, the I don't like the health of the consumer question. I believe that the consumer just is much more particular today than they were pre-COVID, and they're just not tolerating lousy product, lousy engagement, uh, and 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 uh, you know, and they want what they want when they want it. So they're not really shopping anymore. They're going in and saying, "I want this particular thing," and if they don't want it, it's easy to blame it on the consumer. But I think you should blame it on the brand or the retailer for not engaging that customer properly in the way they want to be engaged. Crocs has done a very good job of that. They've had some some execution issues especially with Hey Dude that set them back in that regard, but I never I, I don't think it's I don't think that a brand or a retailer can do anything about what the customer does except for improve the way they engage that customer. And um unfortunately, I think a lot of brands and retailers don't understand or don't particularly haven't particularly adjusted to the way the consumers changed which then they blame on oh the consumers weak the consumers this consumers that but if you look at the Crocs brand it's doing exceptionally well if you look at hey dude it's sort of in between but then they overloaded too much inventory in the marketplace at the beginning of last year which led to some weakness in the brand so it was an execution issue if you look at ugg or birkenstock you know or hoka or on right now you're looking at that there's high demand for that that particular stuff if you look at some other brands not so much but that's not the consumer that's the brand and that's the engagement and so I think the consumer's fine, but just their standard and their expectations are much higher than they've ever been. And it's, and, and that's the issue with the consumer. It's all about execution, as you said, Sam. Sam Poser, Williams Trading Equity Analyst. Good to talk to you today. Thanks so much. Well, Elon Musk continuing his crusade against the state of Delaware. Spark when a judge invalidated his $56 billion pay package. Here with the latest is our very own Inez Ferre. Inez, SpaceX next to make the move. Yeah, that's right. And Akiko, it is official. SpaceX converted its incorporation state from Delaware to Texas. Elon Musk posted on X last night, if your company is still incorporated in Delaware, I recommend moving to another state as soon as possible. Now, this comes after Delaware's business court struck down Musk's $56 billion Tesla compensation package. Musk has been pushing to move the legal home for his companies out of Delaware. Last week, he moved the domicile for his brain chip implant company, Neuralink, from Delaware to Nevada. And Musk is pushing to reincorporate Tesla, too. But there's no guarantee that will happen for a public company like Tesla. The, this move for a public company requires a majority shareholder vote, Akiko. Uh, meantime, and as uh, we've got SpaceX carrying yet another lunar lander, this one from Intuitive Machines, what more do we know about the launch that happened overnight? Yeah, that's right. A moon lander built by aerospace company Intuitive Machines that was launched from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Its mission is to touch down on the lunar surface. The lander is dubbed Odysseus. It was atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. A live feed of the launch showed the rocket taking off. About 48 minutes later, the lander was released and the separation was confirmed. Now, the lander is carrying six, six NASA payloads of instruments. Those will gather data about the lunar surface, and all of this information will be used for NASA's planned return of astronauts to the moon, which is now slated for 2026. The launch is really significant because a month ago, another private firm launched a lander which suffered a propulsion system leak, and that had been the third failed attempt at a soft landing on the moon from a private company. So as for Odysseus, it is expected to land on the moon on February 22nd near the moon's south pole.
at Kiko. Okay, well, I'll be keeping our fingers crossed there. And as for I, thanks so much. Thank you. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. If you're enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, it is time to decide if you want to make a change to your coverage. Medicare Advantage enrollees can switch plans or transfer to traditional Medicare during the open enrollment period ending in March. Here with the details on what you need to know is Yahoo Finance's Carrie Hannon. Uh, Carrie, walk us through the checklist. Oh, hi, Akiko. Yeah, this is important. You know, it's not just cranky people who are switching plans. Um, you know, studies have shown, a recent one I looked at, that, you know, people, um, more than 50% of people tend to change plans within five years after they sign up. Uh, generally going to another Medicare Advantage plan. And I should note that 51% of the Medicare population, those 65 and over, now are in these Medicare Advantage plans. You know, and the incentive there is, you know, that they have no or low premiums and they offer kinds of extras that you don't get from traditional Medicare, like vision, dental, maybe a gym membership. But what's happening is as people get older, um, when you first sign up for your Medicare Advantage plan, um, there's a set of providers that you can go to. And so this is the issue. People are switching because they're looking for their doctors and you're restricted on what doctors are in your network. So the ones you initially sign up for are not necessarily still there or the ones you need as the years go on, as you get older, you might need a specialist, you might need some more doctors, you might develop, you know, chronic illnesses in some way. And those providers, you have to get special authorization, and that can take forever, or it can be rejected. So the people I talk to often feel they're trapped. So this is your opportunity to say, okay, I can look around, and I can see if the doctors I need to go to are in a new plan, a Medicare Advantage plan, or you can go back to traditional Medicare right now. And again, that is, ter is terrific in the sense that you have no restrictions on your medical and healthcare providers, but there are some extra costs involved there that you need a Medigap policy, it's called. And here's the caveat that, that makes that a little tricky, is that a Medigap policy, um, when you first enroll in Medicare, you, they have to uh, approve you for this extra coverage uh, regardless if you have a pre-existing condition. But after one year, if you switch back from Medicare Advantage to Medicare, if you've made that decision, uh, they no longer have to. So you might not get 
the ability to get one of these plants if you have a pre-existing condition. Doesn't mean you won't, it just could be a problem. So it really is important. I think the main issue is trying to take control of your Medicare, uh, your, your medical care. And Medicare Advantage has some great incentives there to do so. But this is your time if you don't want to get locked out of using those physicians, those specialists you need, and you're a little upset about your network, now's your time to take action. We are going to see some changes coming up. New rules came down in January, starting in 2026 authorizations by Medicare Advantage are going to have to speed up so people have a better idea of what coverage they can get. Okay, some good tips there. Carrie Hannon, as always, thanks so much for that. Well, earnings results for Roku are on deck. The company set to report after the market closed today, while investors are also eyeing quarterly results next week from Warner Brothers Discovery. Here with key themes to watch, we've got our very own Ali Canal on the beat for us today. Ali. Hi, Keiko. That's right. Earnings season not done yet. We have a few key media companies set to report in the coming weeks. As you mentioned, Roku is first up after the bell today. So let's start there. Wall Street is expecting revenue of $964 million. That's ahead of company guidance and will be on an adjusted loss of 55 cents a share. Now, Roku should continue to benefit from strengthening video ads and recent streaming price hikes, especially as the market changes and focuses more on connected TV advertising. Active user growth, that's going to be another metric to keep an eye on. Consensus estimates are calling for gains of $2.7 million in the quarter. And then when it comes to profitability, that's something that Roku has been especially focused on. They've actually committed to layoffs throughout 2023 in order, in order to get there. And analysts do expect Roku to surpass its EBITDA forecast of $10 million, um, again, as the company has been really doubling down on those efforts. And then if we switch gears to Warner Brothers Discovery, Wall Street is expecting revenue of $10.5 billion on an adjusted loss of $0.08 cents a share. Now, WBD is in a pretty tough position as it deals with the declining TV business with linear ads expected to decline by double digits once again. We've seen that in a few quarters now. Now, this is likely going to continue to be a problem for the company throughout 2024, despite strong free cash flow of over $5 billion in 2023. I expect we're going to see that hit to EBITDA, that hit to earnings due to the TV business. But at the same time, we have seen Warner Brothers really leaning into a licensing, licensing first strategy. So because of that, that should alleviate some of the earnings pressure. And then when we think Think about the streaming service Max, a strong slate should boost subscribers. But overall for this company, the focus is going to be on paring down that debt, delevering that balance sheet, and then the potential for M&A. WBD has been one of those names floated around when we think about media consolidation. So all eyes are going to be on that earnings call next week. Okay, certainly going to be an interesting one. Ellie Canal, thanks so much for that. That does it for me in the 11 a.m. Eastern hour as we look at where markets are trading right now. The Nasdaq, the only one in the red, uh, down about 46 points there. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.